No, right. <laughs> All right, here we go. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the live stream. We have a wonderful show for you tonight. We're going to have Mark Seifter on, co-creator co of Pathfinder 2. We're going to be talking encounter design. He is the master of encounter design in Pathfinder 2. He helped create the game system, so he knows what he's talking about. We shall assume, and I'm pretty sure he does. So that's what we're talking about tonight. Uh, we have to do some of our standard informational junk and sleazy plugs to get us rolling here. The first thing that we're going to talk about is we have a giveaway going on tonight. We always have a giveaway going on, so you can join at the link in chat. Once, once Stream Elements actually decides to run, uh, you will see a chat link down in the link of the chat where you can join the giveaway. Uh, that's assuming Stream Elements decides to run tonight. Sometimes it takes the night off. Uh, but we will draw the winner to the giveaway and you can get a hard copy of Into the Fae uh, or you can get DMR store credit as well if you win the giveaway. The other thing that we need to do here is thank all of our wonderful patrons who help us keep the lights on around here. They help. Obviously, we do all the free videos. We do these live streams, giving you guys information for your games. Tonight, we're talking about Pathfinder 2. Other times we talk about D&D. A lot of times we just talk about general game master advice to help you guys out. So all of these awesome patrons help make that possible. We also have tons of free information over on the DMLayer.com, free resources, adventures, lots of cool stuff you guys can use. Patrons make it possible. Also, our patrons get Lair Magazine every month, which is our premium resource for patrons, our premium product that we put out. Lots of 5th edition adventures, Pathfinder 2 adventures. In fact, Lair Magazine is for both 5th edition and Pathfinder 2. So no matter which game system you're running, you can get awesome crap to use in your games. So our patrons get all of that every single month, new issues, new resources and stuff like that. So thank you patrons for everything that you do. And then these folks right here bribe me with extra money. So they get their names read out loud. Here we go. Agile Monk, Alex S, Alexander O, Alan D, Amanda W, Ambers, Angelique K, Anton K, Art Soccer, Ashley, Alucas, Behavis Khan, Peace in Space, Black Wolf, Brad M, Bradley H, Brandon A, Brandon P, Brian D, Brian O, Brian the Lion, Brian J, Carl, Chris C, Christine B, Christopher G, Colette H, Colin W, Connor D, Contra Gravy, Corey A, Courtney H, Daz What Up, David S, Da Wolf, Dalen W, Dean B, Derek E, Derek K, Dice Goblin Wannabe, Dominic S, Don D, Dazim, Dungeon of Terra, Dutch, Ed R, Edward B, Edward L, M, Frabo, and Dorian 72, Eric B, Erno T, Gabriel T, Gary C, Gene A, Generic Throwaway 100, George E, George R, Greg P, Guapo, GDTM, Hard on Gale, Heltong, HLD, Iron Cascade, Jackie Pizza, Jake L, Jacob K, James C, James K, James L, Jan F, Jennifer M, Jeremy W, Harry, Jim P, Joanne P. That's what I do when people don't give me like pronounceable names. I just kind of like spit out a bunch of sounds. Joel, Joel A, John A, John J, John the Wicked, John Pinkanos. Jonathan F, Jonathan S, Jonathan V, Jordan, Jordan A, Jose, Joseph H, Joseph W, John M, Josh M, Josh S, Joshua G, Juan, Kamada, Kikano Tsuki, Kevin F, Kevin B, Kill Saber K, Curry, Curry Claw, Laura L, Laser H, Osvaya, Letter Mage, Lionheart, Linda, Loki, Lord H, Luke E, Matlock, Macy S, Magna, Marcel V, Matt S, Matthew C, Matthew C, Meepa Node, Meepy, Michael G, Mero Stahl, Mitchell, Mo 20s, Mordak, and Mr. Oliver with glasses in order 900, Nicholas H, Nick H, Nereth, Old Man Mage, Paul B, Paul S, Pethnik, Pivo, Pork Chop, Bacon, Puppet Master, Quith Nemo, Randy B, Rebar, Ryder C, Richard M, Rob B, Robert C, Robin B, Brian Saul R, Sakura, Samuel M, Scott R, Scott S, Sibarin, Shadow, Shane L, Simfan, Snowbor, Gaming, Son of a Sofa Man, Soul Naya, Stan the Man, Stephen G, Stephen T, Steve S, Sturm, Terry V, The Three Quarters Hospital, The Old DM, The Wookiee, The Fuzzle, The New Ed Ombre, Thomas F, Thomas J, TK, Travels of the Lost Trinity Series, T. Warner, Tyler D, Tyler R, Unalloyed, Undying Warlock, Valagor, Vent Song, Victoria Q, Vinny, Vladimir S, Vault O, Wesley K, William, William C, XX Red Drum, Zachary J, Zombie Trami. Wee. Right, there we go. We have read the names off, and now we welcome our special guest. Wee. What's up, Mark? How you doing, buddy? Doing all right. How are you doing, Luke? Great. Great, I need a break from reading that list. So now it's your turn. All to right. Talk. So anyway, we're yeah, he's coming out. We're talking about Pathfinder 2 encounter building. Now, 
we were chatting a little bit beforehand and some of this is going to cross over maybe to other RPGs like D&D and stuff like that. Some of this will be specific to Pathfinder 2. Um, but that's, that's right. The, that's the night. We got two hours. We're going to talk encounter building so that game masters can walk away and have a clue. Sometimes it can be frustrating to get like encounters that are awesome, you know. So what do you got for us, man? Uh, Where do you want ben? to start? Ben? Ben? Is that like a... Is that me? Huh? Did I call you Ben? Yeah. I don't think so. I called you... You're Mark, dude. I, your name is right there on the screen. Yeah, that's true. I don't know, Chad. Didn't he call me Ben? I think right, let's, so. Let's, let's so, do what Chad thinks. Who in chat we'll thinks chat I called thinks. him Ben? Or who thinks <laughs> who thinks I would say something else? I don't remember, dude. There you go. So um, basically, it is true that some of the principles of good encounter design are going to apply in Pathfinder 2 or in other similar RPGs or even in any mm -hmm. RPG. And some of the principles of cool encounter design, too. A cool encounter is not always the same thing as a good encounter. So before we get started talking about how to design encounters, I want to I want to go with um, some meta principles first. Mm. One of them is all of the techniques that I'm going to teach you tonight, especially for making a like a spectacular and memorable encounter your players will never forget. You should not use those every time. If you do, it's kind of like taking the most delicious spiciest spice that you have in your cabinet and putting it on every food and drink that you ever serve to anyone it not mm. only is it not right for every dish or drink that you're serving but it will also makes it so it t feels less special during the times when you do use it because it, you've put it on everything at this point yeah it's kind of like i have pie leftovers still from thanksgiving and my mom made us like four big pies and I'm getting tired of eating pie, dude. And I love like apple pie and crap, but it's getting old. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. So um, it is exactly like that. Your players will eventually get fatigued by these like outrageous, memorable encounters that they'll never forget. Like. Your brain only has space for a certain number of encounters that you're going to never forget. And sometimes mm. you need a, a simple, fluffy encounter that's easy and doesn't have all sorts of bells and whistles added to it. Right. So I wanted to start by giving that warning. Mm -hmm. And just so that people don't think, oh, yeah, Mark Seifter says every one of your encounters needs to have all of these complexities added to it. Like sometimes yeah. an easy fight, one that's too easy is great we'll get into that later in the mm -hmm. in the in the show and sometimes a uh, a simple fight one that's just very very simple is the right call right it, it's 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 better for players but it's also better for the game master can, can you imagine if the <laughs> game master has to every single encounter has to be this like terrain and environmental effects and like a boss type and minions and they're doing this and then you know in round three i'm going to change the dynamics so something different is happening you know and it's like oh my gosh and then reinforcements come and every single encounter has to be this big ordeal it's going to get exhausting to prepare your sinking game you know it's going to take 100%. you forever you know so yeah you can't it's it's not it's not sustainable either just from a game master point of view <laughs> Yep, and we can tell just from how much experience Luke has uh, in the DM layer of making all of these adventures for Layer Magazine and such because you immediately were able to just rattle off a bunch of good things that you would want to add to sure. a, yeah. to like a very memorable, evocative encounter. And those are exactly the things that you don't want to always add every time because right, it will right. get out of hand. Yeah. So let's get started for Pathfinder 2 with the Pathfinder 2 Encounter Builder. So, if cool. you are coming to this because your experience is, say, mostly with 5e, or, and you're like, okay, but I want to see how encounters are done in Pathfinder 2. I've heard good things. One of the most important things you need to learn about the Pathfinder 2 Encounter Builder is that Pathfinder 2 Encounter Building, it actually kind of looks kind of like Pathfinder 1 Encounter Building, which looks kind of like some DD3 edition counter building and even kind of like 5e encounter building at first but you may be familiar with the fact that all of those other editions i named they, they they have this very precise way that you measure how many creatures you're supposed to put into an encounter and then usually the encounters are not 
their difficulty is not really very related to the way that the encounter builder says they will be generally it's so mm. far off that unless you play test them in any of those uh in 3.0 3.5 pathfinder 1 or 5e <clears throat> um you could find that usually it's that your monsters are too weak even though the encounter builder said that they would be strong enough but sometimes if they have a weird special ability that targets mm -hmm. a type of saving throw your group is bad against that they're actually too strong and the encounter builder said they would be weak right. the thing to learn with the pathfinder 2 encounter builder is that within reason you can mm -hmm. trust it yes. and i say within reason because yeah. look okay there's still some amount of art and not a 100 science to mm -hmm. like including different creatures even to the extent of like, well, you know, this creature encountered four of the same monster maybe is less effective than if you did four different monsters that all had extremely mm -hmm. complementary abilities. Like yeah. this one monster that can stop you where you are and you can't move, but has no ranged attacks is like, okay, well, you can't run away from it, but it'll still have to come mm -hmm. up to you to fight it. But if you encounter it with three monsters who all have powerful ranged attacks, yeah. Um, that's trouble. very different than encountering four of them that stop you in place and all have to come into melee with you. So yeah. Now, when you're talking about the encounter builder, you're talking about the tool you use when you're determining how many monsters of what level to put for your group of this many characters of this level, right? That one hundred percent. That, that and you'll see that in the yeah. That's in the dungeon master's guide for five yeah. e. It's right. in the game uh, master guide or the GM core for um pathfinder 2 right and every every edition of any kind of DD like game or pathfinder s game is gonna have something like that to help you learn how to build encounters in fact almost even even rules lighter games tend to have yeah. something that well, will help you build the encounter I, I may have missed it but i've been reading the crap out of dungeon crawl classics recently and i don't think there's really anything in there that tells me what to throw at players it's just kind of like yeah you know throw some stuff at them and whatever so like but that's a different the the feel of that is a whole lot grittier and like i don't know there's a different feel of that game system but i didn't find an encounter building system in there which was interesting i may have missed it though i may have missed it <laughs> no you're right that some in some osr situations mm -hmm. they, they they their statement is kind of more like Look, dude, monsters yeah. are always deadly. Yeah. They could kill you at any time. You probably want to find a way to like drop a boulder on them from above where you're not even really fighting them fair because yeah. fighting smart and not getting into the encounter is the real way to win or bypass them or something. Yeah. And if it comes down to a fight, good luck. And sometimes they do say that and they mm -hmm. don't really give a good sense. But even then, there's just sometimes like a tacit thought that if like a level or rating of challenges listed for the creature that like you roughly want to not be too many levels mm -hmm. below it but yeah. you're right um but even even somewhat lighter games uh that have combat in them usually tend to give you at least some rough estimation of what they expect the combat to look like yeah yeah and I, some I, don't yeah. most do and pathfinder I, 2 definitely has one yeah you can find it if you are um it's actually in the core rulebook not the game master guide um or in the gm core if you're using the remaster mm -hmm. uh because the basic game mastering information was in the core rulebook that's why it was such a gigantic book yeah when we when we wrote it and, one and of the, so and there are there are online tools as well that are crazy yeah. useful to be able to just punch numbers and find monsters and stuff too so yeah, really I think there's something called like something with Fight Club that just does it for you when you Maybe. tell it what level you want. But yeah. um, I have like three of them bookmarked that I yeah, use depending absolutely. on my use case. But yeah, uh huh. Sure. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about the types of encounters that the encounter builder in Pathfinder 2 is meant to build. Mm -hmm. If you've watched the other few um, DM layer streams with me before, I have talked about these types of encounters before but we only use them in the process of determining like how long your adventuring day would be in a mm -hmm. previous episode. Yeah. Today, I want to talk about them in and of themselves because these are the types of encounter that the at least the Pathfinder 2 encounter builder thinks are distinct from each other and that you might want to build. Mm -hmm. So we'll start with an extreme threat. That is an encounter that according to the encounter builder is so dangerous, it's likely to be an even match for the PCs, especially if they're low on resources. Uh -huh. They're too challenging for most uses. Yeah. 
Yeah. Maybe if you're fully rested or you know it's a climactic encounter and you're going to use uh-huh. all the consumable resources in potions and things you built up over the course of the campaign or you like yeah. have the drop on them and do a bunch of pre-buffing and get this the mm-hmm. um like the environment in your favor maybe because the problem is if it's a roughly an even match then that means that there could be like a half chance of a tpk every time you run one of these now if you have yeah. a group of veteran players using advanced tactics <laughs> and strong teamwork mm-hmm. maybe they can consistently beat these especially right. if they're higher level right these are very, very rarely the right thing to do. But yeah. the system assumes you might want to build them, and so it mm-hmm. puts it in there. Yeah, absolutely. Like, if I'm running, like, I might not even consider using Extreme for even, like, an Adventures boss. But if it's the campaign finale, that, then I'm thinking that's probably an Extreme scenario, at least for the way I run my games, you know. But yeah, I, my experience has been, like, I can mostly trust the Pathfinder 2 encounter calculator. If it says it's going to be moderate, it usually is. If it says it's severe... It's probably going to be a rough fight. Like, I've learned that I can usually trust that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I completely agree. Your adventure boss almost definitely should not be extreme. Almost definitely. Not always. It depends. Did the PCs have, like, a really good situation going into it? Do they have extra buffs or consumable resources? But usually not. Maybe the campaign boss. And, And sometimes you can't... With the Game Master, when you're planning the adventure, you can't account for whether they are going to get the drop on them, whether they're going to have good tactics mm-hmm. and plan for it. Like, you just don't know what they're going to do. They could blunder in there blindly, and you were like, well, I thought they'd plan for it, and then everything goes to crap. You know, so that's, right. it's hard to uh, to know in advance, you know? If there's even any chance that they're just going to blunder in, that they won't know this mm-hmm. is the campaign finale or even the adventure finale, then it's probably already not it shouldn't be extreme right yeah even if it actually is the campaign finale but they just blunder into it and they're like all right well you know that door looks like all the other doors we'll open it up all right inside you find the campaign finale like if that is even possible (laughs) then yeah it should probably not be extreme but if it's very telegraphed as the campaign finale especially if you're at higher levels then like extreme starts being more on the table and Mm -hmm. you'll know your group by then right yeah so the next easiest after extreme and by the way this next one is not easy at all i just started from the hardest one so it's it's the second hardest type of encounter that the um, pathfinder 2 encounter builder will try to help you build is a severe threat encounter so if an extreme threat encounter is supposed to be about equal to the pcs the yeah. severe threat encounter is like eh, roughly three quarters as strong as the PCs. And because the PCs have that advantage of, of being about 33% mm. stronger than the encounter is, they're expected to be able to probably consistently defeat it. Probably. But what I've noticed is I throw severes at my party with regularity. Okay. Because that's just the type of game I run. And this is what happens. Round one, somebody usually goes down. Round two is like, try to save them, you know? Round three, people are going down every round and it's like this teetering balance of like, holy crap. You know, that's what so, I found. But but the question is, did they die? And I know the answer was yes in one case. In one case, yes. Um, but in the other but case- But that was, that was covered sort of in the bad yeah, luck, poor right. tactics or lack of resources due to prior encounters can easily turn yeah. a severe yes. threat against the yes. characters. I'm reading from the core rulebook in this case. Yes, correct. Now in the other cases, they- in the other cases where they had severes, I think once there was a character death, but the group won overall. Yes. In the other cases, people just yo-yo back up and down. Not too long because it gets yeah, the really wounded bad. condition. Oh gosh, it, it, one person was like one step away from going down again and just dying outright. You know, yeah. so you got it was getting one of those was it's getting terrifying. pretty bad. But anyway, it, it definitely feels severe. Like you, it's a run for your money. You know, that's right. And and honestly, Luke, that sounds like it's doing what its job yeah. because. Severe is supposed to be the hot, the most nail-biting, difficult thing that you still will consistently win unless you're low on resources, have very bad luck, um, have poor tactics, something like that. And in that case, you would expect some people to go down because if the PCs, if there's four characters and zero of the four characters go down, and one of the examples of an extreme encounter is three creatures that are equally as strong as the PCs, mm-hmm. If the bad guys lose three of three, 
and the good guys don't even lose one of four, mm -hmm. then it probably wasn't that close of a fight. Right. And maybe it was. Maybe the damage was divided badly mm -hmm. for the bad guys and everybody was low out of the four that were still up. Yeah. I'm not saying that's always going to happen, but yeah, yeah, you will expect to see someone drop in a severe threat encounter mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Now, something that I have found is there, there seems to be a disparity between if I have a severe encounter and let's say that I have four bad guys and it's severe, that usually yeah. isn't that bad. But if I have one bad guy and it's severe, this is what happens. The bad guy's armor class is so high, the PCs have a hard time hitting him. The bad guy's to hit number is so high, he crits most of the time. And then that means his damage, which is also pretty high, gets doubled. And I'm doing like, this is probably around level four, I'm doing 40, maybe 50 points of damage in one hit a lot of times. So what I've found is that when I have a solo bad guy and it's severe, like it's nasty, like even, you know what I mean? Crazy, like overwhelming, like the players are like in despair of their lives. Whereas if I spread it out, like there are four of them, like maybe they're creature level two or something and there are four of them. That's way more manageable than like a, a, a creature level seven, would it be? Seven yeah, it would be it would whatever, be th you know? four level threes or one level seven. Yeah, yeah. Um, the higher that's... one, the level seven, the solo one is like, oh man, it's crazy, you know. So as as an example, when I say it, there's, you can never do it completely scientifically. It is true hmm. that at high levels in PF two, many weaker opponents are a little better. And at low levels in PF2, one single opponent is a little better. Mm, just a more however, powerful. however, it is also true that tactics play a large role. And especially if a group is playing with 5e style tactics, mm -hmm. they can typically handle, actually honestly, most encounters at higher level okay-ish. Mm -hmm. And they can even can't handle the four level three guys at low levels fine, but they yeah. probably can't handle the one level seven at, at, uh, as well if they're using 5e style tactics mm. instead of PF2 style tactics can you for those solos. Yeah, and can you go into a little bit of what you mean by between yes. 5e tactics and PF2 tactics? I was about to, so that's a good transition. So when you're fighting a solo in 5e, and it's higher level than you and the system says this is deadly mm -hmm. and you're level four what you actually know is that you could kind of yawn and win mm -hmm. either the wizard is just going to make them lose automatically with right. some kind of spell and yep. then they and then you win or then maybe they had a legendary resistance if they're lucky and so mm -hmm. the, everybody teams up and gets rid of the legendary resistances and then you yeah. win yeah. or you just beat the crap out of it and win and it can't put out nearly enough to actually threaten you correct like that's just how it goes mm -hmm. in pf2 the solo monsters, especially at lower levels, if not at higher levels, mm -hmm. are designed to be able to actually threaten your entire group. And mm -hmm. that does mean it's hard to get rid of them. And they will get rid of your characters in about two rounds or yeah. one if they are lucky. Yeah. Because honestly, if they can't do that without you healing, right. if they can't even kill one of your characters in two rounds or mm -hmm. one if they are lucky, right. that means that if you literally sat there play at, and you're like, my PC is going to drink a martini, I'm not fighting. Uh -huh. It would take over eight rounds for that solo monster to actually win the fight. Right. Right? And yeah. so... Like, they probably should be able to take out one of your characters in two rounds or one if they're lucky, if they're alone and facing against four right. or more opponents. Right. Now, that can be terrifying if the group doesn't have good ways to get yes. people back up, use defensive uh -huh. options, which I'm not taking into account when I'm saying that um, mm -hmm. they could take out a character in two or one if they're lucky. But if you have good defensive options or mm -hmm. use action choking to um, do things such as don't Leroy Jenkins the boss and charge mm -hmm. right into it and give it three attacks. Make it come to you right. and spend some of its actions. Mm -hmm. Even though your ranged attack is much worse than your melee. Yeah. If it's a solo boss, here's the thing. If it's a solo boss, de delay. if you were like, my ranged attack is so bad, it literally would hurt me to use it. Then you could, <laughs> like... The worst you're going to do is is wait for them to come to you and uh -huh. then skip your turn. Yeah. It's even worse to go up to them and give uh -huh. them more actions. Uh -huh. But if you shoot them, you could even shoot them once and then drop the ranged weapon and draw your melee in, in, in anticipation of them coming in or something like that. The point yeah. is you want to be careful thinking about what actions you're letting them do. And then you want to find ways to 
give your t- your team bonuses or their team penalties against the solo. Mm-hmm. Always be flanking. Yes. For example, yeah. Yeah. because that solo's AC could be a real pain to hit, but yeah. that solo's AC with a minus two, mm-hmm. it's probably much more hittable. It's probably yeah. getting closer to the AC that you would have seen on one of the big, uh, the group of enemies if mm-hmm. you didn't have a flank because there were so many of them, yeah. you couldn't have them all flanked. Uh-huh. Then there's only one enemy, it's easier to deny them actions, mm-hmm. to throw a debuff on them because a single target debuff hits the only enemy that's around now. They might, it might be hard to stick the debuff on them. Right. So find ones that work even if they succeed on their save, mm-hmm. uh, if yep. you can. Yeah. And it's easier to do things like flanking because there's only one opponent to flank. Yeah. So um, you, you want to try to do, and obviously if you flank, you are letting them get all their attacks on your team. Mm-hmm. So make sure that if you're going to let them get all their attacks, you're getting something out of it, like flanking. Mm -hmm. So these are all tactics that honestly would be good tactics in in 5e or another game too if the bosses were threatening. You just don't need them. (laughs) Like if the bosses were threatening in 5e and and, and it was this case that if you stood next Uh to the dragon it would probably kill you, I would also say things like try to get out of the range of its movements, spread Mm -hmm. out so its breath weapon can't hit all of you. And like it it would work in other games. It's just that Pathfinder 2 tries to make a system where that one... Yeah. level seven opponent yeah. if you don't watch out and you kind of desert rush it can take you all down yeah and you um, said yeah you said something like a, a few minutes ago you said that it can be terrifying to players you know yeah and that's what i want like i after look at after almost a decade of running fifth edition i want players to be on edge and be like holy crap this is brutal we might lose like i don't want them to lose like i want to keep playing the game and i don't want players to feel like you know like it's hopeless and stuff so I want there to be that they know that there's a chance, but I want them to feel that like, holy crap moment of like, geez, we're dropping and this is brutal. Oh my gosh, we got to really figure this out because that just, it makes the game more interesting. I'll tell you what, man, we have some of these Pathfinder 2 battles that I swear we're over there playing these battles and they, they might've lasted an hour, hour and a half. I don't know because the whole time we're on edge and we're just like, geez, good, good. And it's tactics and we're just considering and I'm playing and they're playing and it's like, oh my gosh. And the next thing you know, it's like, oh my gosh, you just won. Okay, cool. But you don't feel that time going by slowly because you're on edge and it actually matters. Like your tactics and what you do, whether you flank or not, everything matters, you know? And I, that's what I love. The more I play Path Road 2, this is one of the things I love more and more about it. You know what I mean? That makes it more interesting. And then I have my IV game and I'm just kind of like, the battles are all just so slow and uninteresting, you know? So I don't know. There's, there's something really cool there that I, that I really like about it, you know? Yeah, no, I, I know what you're talking about. And um, for me, yes, I feel this feeling of like relief and exaltation. And it's like, yes, I can't believe it. We got this. When when you were on edge, you were like, what's going to happen? Mm-hmm. It's kind of like things like, um, you know, like Monster Hunter or other games where you're fighting the one big opponent. Those things are usually scary. Yeah. You want to be doing things like dodging and staying out of their hit range rather mm-hmm. than just like go up to the monster, monster hunter, and just beat it with the weapon and stand right in front of its attack animation. Yeah. And, um, but this is another example of the thing I was talking about with putting the same spice too many times. It can be a problem. Mm-hmm. If your group mm-hmm. is constantly uh, living in that with that fear and anxiety from every fight, it can wear out its welcome. Right. Which is why you want to make sure not to use too many severe encounters. Use them when it matters. Use them when you know this is a big deal and Mm. you want that feeling. And that means to save them as a sometime snack. If you spend in Mm. too many severes, and you know what? Some published adventures have done this, partially because they felt like they were, even by Paizo, right? Partially because Mm. they felt like they needed to pack in a lot of XP to level people up yeah. in a certain number of page count. Yep. And mm-hmm. I think to their detriment, use mm-hmm. maybe too many severe encounters too yeah. quickly. Yeah. Yeah. My group has been leveling fairly slowly. Like, like mm-hmm. I'll, they'll, they go on, I'm used to like, well, in fifth edition, I use milestones. So I'm just used to like, you go on one adventure. It usually takes about three game sessions. You level up, you know, um, in Pathfinder two, it, it's taken longer than that level. You know, because I'm just I look like, like I'm just putting third lows and maybe a moderate and then maybe you know a severe, but like a lot of the encounters aren't giving them tons of experience points. And I'm I am using experience points because in Pathfinder 2 and I run it right now because I want to feel 
that, how that system works, understand it before I move on to like something else like Milestones, you know? Yeah, but... Milestone works great too, but I think mm. that's a good idea just to get a sense for what, yeah. because especially you do uh, Layer Magazine, it's mm. good to know what the, like the default system is. It works yeah. great with Milestone. It works great with the XP system that mm. it has, I think. Yeah. So let's move down from a severe encounter. We're going to get to the two types of encounters that are the best to use a lot mm. of the time. So um, moderate encounters, they are the, they are easier than severe, but they're the first encounter type, or I guess they, I would say they're the, the last one we're going to talk about in this list that really are a serious challenge. They probably won't kill your PCs from, or, or really overpower them greatly from full, unless the PCs are in a really bad way, really bad tactics, or like really, really, really bad luck. But they generally will require the PCs to spend enough resources that it affects them for the rest of the day. They're down by some amount that unless they happen to play classes and combinations that are all like at will abilities, mm -hmm. they're probably down by some amount that means they're less ready to fight harder encounters, more moderates or severes in the future of that adventuring day. Yeah. That's the main thing about um, uh, a moderate. And moderates usually actually do feel like they have some tension in them, mm -hmm. especially if the group doesn't like metagamingly know exactly how hard every encounter is and they treat the moderate lightly where they don't want to spend mm -hmm. um, resources proactively on them and they're like, ah, whatever, we'll just use our weakest stuff on this. Then the moderate mm -hmm. will start pushing back. Usually at least yeah. they're designed to push back a little harder than you expect at that point, mm -hmm. causing people to like, sort of refocus not the little refocus action but like kind of think about it and reconsider and be like oh yeah maybe we should spend maybe we should take this a right. little more seriously yeah. now and then you get yeah. rid of it or you go in yeah. guns blazing uh -huh. and it's fine right yeah it's that probing action right of like let's see what we're dealing with before we actually start using resources and so you're taking it easy but then it's like oh gosh this is actually a harder one okay let's go guys let's start doing some stuff here yeah yep uh -huh. because a moderate solo is still pretty strong mm -hmm. at fighting you. Um, yeah. And so if you if you take it seriously, you're going to be fine usually against a moderate solo. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, and especially at like at first and second level, sure, you're at first and second level. So a, a solo, at first level, your hit points are so low that a solo yeah. might be able to drop you with a yeah. crit, like no matter what, even yeah. a low threat one, maybe mm -hmm. if you're very unlucky. Yeah, that's, um, that's like but, a problem in a lot of game systems. So low levels, you're just you're squishy, dude. It, it's so swinging, you know. It's yeah. a thing. It's yeah. a problem. I think it's a problem. Not everyone does. Mm -hmm. Like we could have not had this in Pathfinder mm -hmm. One, but at least uh, like there definitely was some some number of the people who play the game and also other designers who appreciate the idea that at first level things are dicey and you yeah. could get unlucky and you feel more they, they felt that makes you feel more like you're leveling up and feel more powerful that it doesn't happen as much later yeah but it wouldn't have been that hard to um to take that out of first level if if that's what all of the designers and and play testers wanted us to do yeah. you, you um, I, it seems like you would just essentially need to give each character an extra hit point like you know buffer you know like correct 10 extra hit points you're probably going to take away the threat of death at low levels you, know. you you give like some extra hit points, mm -hmm. slightly buff the damage of the opponents, but not nearly as much as the extra hit points. Yeah. But just so that you can make sure that when you then get up to higher levels mm -hmm. with also that buffer, that mm -hmm. the 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 groups of low level enemies are fine. Yeah. And yeah, that I mean that's what you would do. In fact, if you mm -hmm. want to avoid it in a simple way, you could just throw an extra level worth of hit points. So if they're like an eight per level class, throw an extra eight, maybe without the con. Yeah. um yeah. onto mm -hmm. characters or something like that so that's a moderate threat they'll use up resources mm -hmm. maybe the pieces will lose if they are very bad tactics very bad luck also yeah. just sometimes if you if you messed up and put environmental things or other other situations that actually made the fight very favorable for the enemy it yeah. might be like not really moderate and then could get very mm -hmm. serious in any of these cases because right. they adjust the difficult the difficulty should be adjusted for anything that is so powerful for one side that it essentially adds more to their side like mm -hmm. 
obviously if you put in a hazard they literally have an xp amount that they're worth and we'll get into the xp budgets once we've finished talking about the types of encounters okay but there are things that aren't hazards that still should be considered to be worth some amount of xp like yeah the enemy starting behind a barricade uh... where they can just they're archers and they can shoot you through murder holes and you have to knock down a wall before you can even hit them uh -huh. like if you just are like well it's not a hazard, so I'm not going to include anything for that. Uh, uh, why was it so hard? I had, like, a, well... I had a dungeon once where <laughs> the players were going against, I think, five enemies, and they were either spellcasters or they had ranged attacks. And there was this narrow five-foot corridor, and the enemies were all at the other end here, and they had, like, readied their actions or whatever to just blast people as they came into the hallway. And the players had to, like, take... They would have to take two move actions to get down the hallway or something. It was crazy. And so the, these enemies were staged there. Only the, you didn't shoot lightning bolts at them. It wasn't lightning bolts. It, was, it wasn't that oh, high okay. level quite yet. But the, okay. a player, a, the first player came into the hallway, just boom, 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 boom. I think they might have dropped. And then the other player came in and I, they might have dragged them back or something. I forget what the scenario exactly happened. But they were like, there's no way we can go down that hallway. It's insane. It's, and it was it was a moderate, it, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like even severe. And they're like, we can't go down that hallway. We're all going to die. And so they had to go through, backtrack through the dungeon and go out a different way and stuff. But yeah, it was that that environment, that narrow choke point, and the fact that the enemies all had really good ranged attacks made a huge difference, you know. That's right. So while moderate encounters, you actually have to be good at resource management or use very good strategies if you want to make sure you're equally ready to take on a tough encounter again without resting or at least spending a little bit of time to refocus low threat encounters are ones that are great fun you can use them as bread and butter here's why they present a veneer of difficulty they usually are accurate enough that they're not just missing with every attack the damage that they do is startling enough that when you look at it you're like oh well you know that's adding up but it's not actually <laughs> probably gonna drop you yeah. unless somebody uh -huh. gets really focused fired or yeah. you just ignore the damage for a while you could possibly win while while using only um non-consumable effects like cantrips and basic attacks mm -hmm. But if you do, you might lose more hit points that way. So it might use up like a very small amount of resources or like the ones, you know, the ones that you get back out over 10 minutes, maybe nothing depending on your tactics. And yeah. very, very rarely will there even be a serious threat to the party, but it still usually does enough that it like feels like something's happening yeah. and that you're not just like beating up on defenseless children in the fight <laughs> like like sometimes uh -huh. fights against easy encounters can yeah. can feel yeah you still feel like heroes just that heroes that are winning by a lot rather oh, yeah. than mm -hmm. like heroes yeah. that are struggling against like really challenging opponents yeah uh -huh. yeah totally agree and then the, the trivial though that's those those are the ones that are just kind of like more of like pushovers aren't they that's I, correct yeah it's the last encounter the system assumes you might want to build and uh -huh. they don't give xp so some people uh -huh. are tempted yeah. not to use them mm -hmm. but i am going to tell you tonight be sure to include them mm -hmm. sometimes you don't need a lot of them that gets boring but yeah trivial encounters are ones um and the the threshold i'm going to tell you when we go into the encounter budget is the highest for trivial but really a trivial could be any amount up to that point Anything below low is technically trivial. However, mm. the best trivials are usually near the maximum that a trivial can be. Because yeah. at that point, if you use a maximum encounter for a trivial, they sort of feel like you're still <clears throat> maybe fighting something that's somewhere around your level. Like yeah. the numbers they put out on their attack rolls look like they're close to your AC, even uh -huh. if they miss a lot of the time or don't yeah. hit for a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. And like the, the opponent is not the opponents are not like critically failing on a roll of natural 19 on their die roll or anything <laughs> like that against you like yeah so they, they're at least close enough to being something that you could fight like mm -hmm. that they you might take damage against it right. for example against yeah. a maximum trivial encounter but it's definitely not actually a, a threat to the mm -hmm. pcs even if they um just play around with it and yeah. the only way they're going to really lose significant resources is if they're very wasteful and yeah. they just like, oh my gosh, it's an encounter meteor swarm. It's like, are you sure? Yes, I'm meteor swarming. Well, it doesn't look all that hard. No, 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 no. We need to make sure. 
I, I mean, sometimes also when we get into advanced encounters later on in the show, a trivial encounter plus something advanced, like you got to take them out in one round, or if any of them survive, they'll hit the alarm. Mm -hmm. That actually can be an interesting challenge. Yeah. But yeah. a trivial encounter just on its own, fighting them is not a challenge, but it's still worth it. Right. There's a new number of reasons that they are. One, the PCs want to feel like they're powerful. Mm -hmm. And if every opponent you have is so pathetic that you win easily and they never a threat to you, you kind of feel like you're just beating up on weaklings and you might feel like a bully. Yeah. But a way to do it with feeling like a hero and not a bully and making it easy is especially if you use something that the PCs have fought before. So for example, Luke is running mm -hmm. for level four and they sometimes fight a level seven and are like, oh my gosh, that mm -hmm. level seven almost killed yeah. us by itself. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you what, um, let's find like a level seven monster in, in PF2. I, I can't think of one off the top of my head that is exactly level seven. Mm -hmm. So I will go with... Um, Nah, nah, I don't know. Do you know one that you've Gosh. recently had them fight? I don't, I don't know exactly, but let's just pretend it was okay. a... Yeah, let's we'll just say a vampire a count was level 7, sure. even though it's level 6. Yeah, sure. Or a wyvern. It was an elite yeah. vampire count that you created yeah. that was slightly stronger than mm -hmm. the regular vampire count. Yeah. And it was a huge pain, and right, it right. almost killed them and drank their blood, but they did win. Mm -hmm. But now, um, what you can do is when the PCs are level, let's say... 11 you can make them fight four vampire counts mm -hmm. and it's a trivial encounter right and four of these elite vampire counts that are level seven and you'd be like yeah this guy is here with like his um his brother and his two sisters and they've teamed oh. up because it's been a long time since you fought them at level now three. they want revenge they want revenge yeah but th this is a very bad decision on their part because they're yeah. now a trivial encounter right because right. they did not level up as much as the pcs yeah. and so you uh -huh. wipe the floor with them and it's yeah. someone they know and they know yes. how strong he was so yes. it makes them feel exactly. how much they've progressed yeah they feel awesome because they're like look at just a little bit ago we almost died to this guy and now we're so powerful we just destroyed him and his buddies and it makes them feel good you know yep. so yeah absolutely one of, now one of the things that i've noticed and this is possibly a reason that in fifth edition at the very least using easy encounters tends to feel unsatisfying is that an easy encounter can still take a long time to play out at the game table. Like I've been in these encounters where it's like, it's obvious the players are gonna win. Like the monsters stand no chance. You can just know they don't, you know? And yet you still gotta sit there for an hour in this stinking combat, slugging away, beating away at these monsters, you know? Now what I found in Pathfinder 2 though, is that if it's a if it's a trivial or a low like that combat doesn't last very long it's usually over like lickety split because it's lopsided enough that the players are just like pounding these guys down and they're just done moderate's going to take a little bit longer obviously a severe usually longer you know but the the easier ones the trivial and lows this doesn't take a whole lot of time at the game table which i feel is awesome because it encourages you to put some of them in the game and not feel like you, you're, you're wasting your game session, you know? So you're getting like the advantages of sh having the players beat somebody up and feel awesome, you know, but it doesn't take up your whole game session either. It's like, oh yeah. And, and the fact that it doesn't take very long to beat them up and win demonstrates how how powerful the characters are and makes them feel even, feel even better, you know? So that's just something that I've noticed that I really enjoy um, about the system, which in fifth edition you can't do that if it's an easy encounter it still takes you an hour sometimes you know so that's um, a very astute observation would it surprise you luke if i told you that the reason that that's true is also the same reason that those solo monsters are threatening your group here's mm, why okay both of those two things are true for the same reason in 5e if you want to have a short encounter the answer the question is did your wizard or other spellcaster use a significant resource to do some kind of spell that just won the encounter immediately yeah. mm -hmm. that is how you have a short encounter because yeah. hit points are high enough and damage is low enough mm -hmm. that otherwise it's going to take a while before yep. it's over either way right um it's an attempt to stop rocket tag in theory although the without legendary resistances which themselves can be very um kind of annoying to encounter as a player um unfortunately you can still have rocket tag with non-damaging effects what, what do you but, mean by um, rocket tag 
Define. Rocket tag is a term that me is talks about. Um, it's you talked about it in tabletop RPG spaces to mean like it's like playing tag with a rocket launcher uh-huh. where um, somebody goes first, they shoot their rocket launcher, and uh-huh. they win. Uh-huh. Um, that is how Five E does not have this as much of a problem, other than the save or lose spells. Yeah. Uh, in hit points, whereas some previous editions, you know, like 3.5, 3.0, mm. Pathfinder 1, did have an issue where if a martial character went first mm. and the and the enemy did not have some kind of weird hard counter that just was like, well, your character automatically loses, then often the martial character could be like, all right, yeah, so I roll these and roll that, and all right, I did 792 damage. It's like, well, I had... <laughs> <laughs> a maximum of 300 that's pretty high in this system you did 792 are you sure let me see the math and they uh, show you the math and you're like actually you messed up you did should have done 822 yeah you forgot 30 yeah, yeah, yeah. but you were right about all the 792 uh-huh. um and then it's like that's rocket tag because okay. it's just over and yeah. so finally like fourth edition before it mm-hmm. um even though it didn't share that much in common both of them wanted to fix the problem of rocket tag right. and they did you don't have rocket tag in damage in 5e. Yeah. You still have it somewhat in condition effects that can win the fight. Yep. And because of that, that means any fight that is won by damage in 5e will probably take a significantly long time. Yes. Pathfinder 2 wants to have its cake and eat it too, because we don't want to mm. have rocket tag. But we right. also do want it so that it doesn't take forever to beat someone who's much weaker than you. Right. Now, that's true on both ends, though. Mm-hmm. If I'm a level seven monster, yes. I don't want it to take forever to be yes. a level th- crappy level three thing. Yeah. Oh, wait, that's the PC in this case. So we, by yeah. virtue of using the critical success, success, mm-hmm. failure, critical failure system that I created for Pathfinder 2. Yeah. One of the main theses when I convinced the other designers to let me give it a try in the play test, because they were initially thinking, you know, that's adds complexity. You have to do a little bit more math. Is it mm-hmm. worth it? That was the question they asked. And they were like, Mark, we like the reasons you gave. Let's let's play test it because yeah. it may be too hard for people, and we'll get rid of it if it is. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons I gave is that that system allows you to do both. Right. And the reason why is once you become much more powerful than your opponent, you yeah. crit them a lot for yeah. double. Right. And that allows you to end the fight yes. much more quickly than if you weren't able to do that. And mm-hmm. that is the that is sort of the silver bullet that um, that makes it the case that these trivial encounters are over very quickly, even if you don't use a save or lose spell. Right. Oh, and by the way, you can use an incapacitation spell at PF2. It'll win the trivial encounters, mm-hmm. but it probably might not win the really hard one. Right. Yeah, and that, and that also depends upon the fact that PF2 doesn't use bounded accuracy. Right, because That's if it used bounded accuracy, then the whole idea of the crits and stuff wouldn't work. Yes, you need both of the... And, and let me describe, just if, if anyone's watching doesn't know how the critical successes and stuff work in mm-hmm. Pathfinder. Basically, in Pathfinder, there's always four degrees of success. If you make the DC by equaling or exceeding it, you will at least succeed. If you make it by 10 or more, you critically succeed. And a natural 20 always increases your amount of success by one step. That means even if, if let's say Luke had the highest armor class ever and he was playing a champion with a shield, my ogre didn't have a good chance to hit Luke. I only would even hit him on a 19. But on a 20, I would still get a crit, even though that didn't hit him by 10 or more because a 20 always pushes you up by one. If you don't reach the DC, you fail. And if you fail by 10 or more, then you critically fail and a natural one pushes you down one step. So by getting uh, and, and critical failures on a fireball, well, you'll take double damage from that fireball. So when you're fighting those four vampires and you're level 11, they, uh, but by virtue of that rule and the fact that the accuracy is not bounded, so it goes up by at least one per level in terms of saving throws, attack bonuses, armor class, those kind of statistics. That means that those third level people that are fighting the elite vampire count, right? That we were talking about here. They are like not very, like their wizard doesn't even have fireball, but if they, they use their fireball equivalent and they're throwing out a, diff, they, they're throwing out a DC 19 and the vampire count is his middle save. So it needs only a five to make the save and mm-hmm. will critically succeed on a 15 and take no damage. But now we're level 11 and 
at level 11, which is actually not the greatest level for um, for me to be as a spellcaster because I'm going to get it up again eventually, but it's a fine level. At level 11, I'm going to have a difficulty class of probably um, 30 now mm. instead of 19. <clears throat> that means this, the, the vampire count. The uh, I, I was doing a non-elite vampire count, so I'll keep doing that. The yeah. vampire count needs a 16 to even save. Right. At all, instead of at, before a fifteen, or, uh, a fifteen was a critical. Right. Now they need a sixteen or they fail, and on a six or lower, they critically fail and take double. Yeah, and that is actually a almost one in three chance of taking double instead mm -hmm. of the fact before where they had like only like a one in four chance of even taking the full damage. Right, and so like. This drastic, in not only that, my highest fireball, if, I, if I'm if i foolish enough to use it on a trivial encounter, I guess, is doing way more damage to begin with at yeah. this point. And I may have a stronger spell than fireball. Maybe I use chain lightning. Mm -hmm. And the amount more damage, that's much more, and it's likely to do double. So mm -hmm. by, by playing around with the toggles, it gives us the ability to make it so that encounters shift and change by more than you might expect. Yeah. And it allows the monsters that used to seem scary to not be scary anymore while making the trivial and easier ones go by quicker so they don't fill up your table with <laughs> yes. huge amounts of time. It's awesome. I love it. Like there, when I was first starting Pathfinder 2, there was like a learning curve and there were things that frustrated me and stuff. But now that I've done it for a while and settled into it, like there's so many little things like this that they just add up and just make it more enjoyable in a lot of different ways, you know? And so, yeah, that's super cool. Now, Absolutely. when you were doing the playtesting, like, mm -hmm. what was the initial reception? Because it was something new that probably people hadn't experienced in a game system before, perhaps. So did they did they just take to it right away, or did it take some warming up to the whole critical there are, system? I think, like, there are game systems that have some kinds of degrees of success. Mm -hmm. And not only that, even some, you know, even D&D systems and Pathfinder 1 sporadically and inconsistently had them. Okay. Like in Pathfinder 1, if you fail to climb check by 5 or more, mm. you fall. Yeah. And if you fail to disable a trap by 5 or more, you set off the trap. And there yeah. were a bunch of things that were like it, but like you didn't know unless you had an encyclopedic memory or looked it up. If you fell to trip by 5 or more, you, you, you got tripped. Yeah. You would have to look it up every time to know if there was something like that. Right. Whereas in Pathfinder 2... There's always four degrees of success. It's possible that your particular thing that you're doing doesn't have a special effect on a critical mm -hmm. failure, like a regular attack roll doesn't yeah. do anything. The fail and the crit fail are both a miss. There's not anything different. But by me, I, I, all I did there was make it so it was sort of institutionalized always, and I added it on the crit end, which there there were things in Pathfinder 1 that were like, if you make it by five or more, like they're, they like you even more on diplomacy or something like that. Like those were in there. And... I just made it be in there consistently and I used right. 10 for a very specific reason, which is mm -hmm. that um, for the same reason that my fellow designers were worried about having to do math, yeah. I didn't want you to have to do math. So I used 10 because Easier. the only number that changes in the, the threshold with 10 is the 10s place. Right. Yep. So if that means if you're trying to hit 20 mm -hmm. to hit the monster, that means you're trying to hit 30 to critically hit the monster. And yeah. 17, you're trying to hit 27 to critically hit. So because of the fact that only the tens place changes, it's much easier to calculate mm -hmm. it. So the yeah. play testers went into it and they loved it. And so the designers, mm -hmm. other designers were like, yes, this is good. We're going to keep it because people cool. liked it. Yeah. We never awesome. knew. We never knew. There were some things uh -huh. that I was worried that people weren't going to like for yeah. this system. One of them was making sorcerers change to use the tradition of magic based on their bloodline. So mm -hmm. if they were from angels, they would be like divine magic. Yeah. I thought when I initially proposed it that mm. no one would like it because they always used to be like wizards and they used the arcane kind of wizardy spells. Mm -hmm. But the designers were like, that's great. But I guess ask the other people at the company in, in house. I was mm -hmm. like, yeah, I bet some of those people aren't going to like it because, mm -hmm. you know, they, they've told so many stories right. and they work on other lines. And yeah. they were all like, that's so good. Oh, I wonder if the fans are going to like it. I was like, yeah, they're probably not going to like it <laughs> because they're used to the sorcerer being yeah. like the wizard one. And now yeah. it's going to be everything. And th yeah. that's going to change their old characters. They might get very upset. Mm -hmm. And then 92% or something like that yeah. of the play testers mm -hmm. were like, yes, we love this change for sorcerers. So I was very yeah. happy because I thought it would get 
so, a bad uh -huh. response because of being a change is actually well yeah. beloved and that sometimes happens in play yeah. tests yeah but that but i think i wonder too if there's a part of that that's like look at for the last 30 years we've been playing the sorcerer the same exact stinking way it's always been this way something fresh might be a welcome change sometimes you know yeah so. it's tough going against tradition but yeah. sometimes it is and that's why you play test because you'll get unexpected results where people really love something or they really hate something you didn't expect yeah so i've talked about mm -hmm. the five types of encounter now you can build a trivial minus encounter that's even weaker than the maximum trivial you could theoretically build an extreme plus encounter that's harder than extreme i've seen people do it sometimes when the PCs had a huge advantage yeah. and i've seen pcs even win it yeah sometimes yeah. when they had a huge advantage or it was against it was harder than extreme because it was against a very large number of enemies mm -hmm. and they used aoe's and yeah. things effectively it it can work mm -hmm. just like the system usually doesn't recommend it even mm -hmm. extremes are not recommended to use all the time and same with trivials yeah. so how does the system work to get this all to function mm -hmm. i mentioned that an extreme is sort of meant to be like about as strong as the pcs roughly a severe is like maybe three quarters of the PCs. A moderate is about half as strong as the PCs. But understand, like, the PCs are powerful. Half of the PCs is strong mm -hmm. enough that, like, if half the if the right half of the PCs attack the other PCs, they probably would have a chance of winning, maybe, if the luck really went with them or the PCs weren't taking it seriously enough. Mm -hmm. And the two PCs who attack the other... Four, who, who, the two evil duplicates that attack the right. four PCs... Yeah really were taking it seriously so yeah that's a moderate and a low encounter is like about um like somewhere between a quarter and a half pretty much like exactly between a quarter and a half okay. uh and then um but but like nobody wants to hear three eighths so. i was just gonna say you mean three eighths <laughs> i do but nobody wants to hear three eighths because that sounds like a scary fraction Luke. i mean i'm just gonna say it's that fractions it's... we did we learned fractions in elementary school didn't we yeah yeah but most <laughs> fractions are scary except for like a quarter and a half and maybe a third maybe right, maybe well, but I'm, it's repeating when it's I'm in not, decimal form okay well we're not afraid of fractions around here <laughs> okay so then three eighths is there is roughly where it it's it's spec to at cool and then a trivial encounter is anything that's about as quarter as strong as the pcs or less this mm -hmm. is like basically if it was a solo opponent it would be like yeah the party's fighter an evil duplicate of the party's fighter wants to fight the entire party together good luck and you can see that's why it would be trivial yeah. because it's yeah. like yeah the party's fighter is pretty strong but they're fighting the entire party together. Yeah. They're probably not going to win against the entire party together, no matter what. Even mm -hmm. if they get very lucky, unless the party was weirdly built where it was like, well, we're a fighter and everybody else just supports the fighter and can't really do much other than that. Even then, they're probably not going to win. Yeah. So um, the way this works is with an XP budget. This also fits into the experience point system. If you're running Milestone, you don't have to worry about the fact that it's XP. You can just consider it the encounter budget. Here's how it works. Essentially, if you are running a severe or sorry, an extreme encounter, you have a budget of 160 experience points. And a creature of the same level as the party is worth 40. There's a table, table 10, 1, and 10, 2, that will show you this. Uh, a creature that's four levels higher is worth 160. That just is on its own an extreme solo encounter. Mm -hmm. But four creatures of the party's level are worth 40 each. 40 times 4 is 160. That means your party's evil duplicates, which mm -hmm. should be about as powerful as them, are worth 160, the exact amount of an extreme yeah. encounter. Mm -hmm. uh, in general, a creature is worth uh, like twice as much as a creature that's two levels lower. And the system math has been built to make that function more or less. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why um, at high levels the mob of enemies can sometimes work better is that at high levels, the monsters two levels lower are maybe like a little bit better than half. And at low levels, they're maybe a little bit worse than half because they're just so low level. Mm -hmm. And that's why the solos are a little stronger at low level and mm -hmm. the and the hordes can be strong at high levels. Because like at some okay. point, a level 18 monster is going to be powerful. Mm -hmm. Even if you're level 20, it's going to be somewhat powerful. So yeah. fighting six of them is, is no joke because mm -hmm. they'll use some weird 18th level monster ability six times on you yeah um 
And so for an extreme encounter, it's it's 160. A severe encounter, 120. That's three quarters. A moderate encounter, you get 80 total experience. A low threat is 60, three eighths. Three eighths. And a trivial is 40 or less. And now that's for four PCs. Right. If you are um, bringing in a smaller or larger number, there's a way you can adjust that. And obviously I said a creature of your level is worth 40. Well, just like I was saying, a creature that's two levels higher than your party is worth 80. Mm -hmm. One that's two levels lower is worth 20. It doubles every two levels. And when you go in between, you get um, generally something that doubles as well every two levels, but the ratio isn't exactly the square root of two because nobody wants to deal with the square root of two. So um, if it's one level lower than your party, it's worth 30. If it's one level higher, it's worth 60 and 30 <clears throat> and 60 are doubled, but they, they're not like the exact square root of two. That would be the worst yeah. thing ever. Nobody wants to have the no, square root of two. No, the square, well, square roots are where you draw the line around here. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> I'm glad you agree because that was never a consideration for Pathfinder 2. <laughs> that would truly be the math finder of all time. Yeah. If it had the square root of two. Um, it would be slightly more accurate, and it is true that you can sometimes have weird edge effects mm -hmm. that make your encounter slightly harder than you expect, entirely based on using minus one or plus ones and them being like rounded a little bit and mm -hmm. not doing the square root of two. Yeah. But um, it, it won't affect you by that much. Mm -hmm. So the way you handle it if you have more characters is essentially that the, the XP for the encounter stays the same, but you get sort of like phantom extra XP worth of monsters to add. In other words, if you had six characters, uh, you know, an extreme or severe encounter should still be worth 160 XP. You shouldn't le like you shouldn't literally level up faster because you had six characters. Right. Mm -hmm. But you get with six characters 240 XP to play with instead of 160 because right. there's in the table it says for each extra character mm -hmm. add 40 more of the monsters, but don't hand that out as XP. Right. And for each missing character, you subtract that much, but you still do hand out all the XP. Also, there's mm, some advice mm. that says, P.S. When you're missing characters, you may need to adjust it by more than that in the PC's favor, because not only are they losing actions at this point, but they may be losing crucial roles within the party. Yeah. That And, and the death spiral is real. Right. What I mean by the death spiral is this. You've got four characters. We'll talk about Luke's scenario. There's a boss who's like, ah, I took down your guy. And you're like, oh, yeah, my healer healed my guy. And my other two people beat the crap out of you. Okay, yeah, I took down your guy. All right, my healer healed my guy. And the other two people beat the crap out of you. And that can keep happening until right. the boss is dead. Right. If you've got two people, mm -hmm. I took down your guy. All right, well, I healed him. And then he stood up. I took down your guy. All right, I healed him. And then he stood up. That's if you're lucky and you have a healer. It could uh -huh. also be, I took down your guy. Maybe it took two rounds to do that, and you did some damage first because you made uh -huh. it an easier encounter, right? Okay, yeah. I have no way to get him back. All right, great. Well, I'm much stronger than you, and I'm facing you one-on-one -on -one at this point. Good luck. And so yeah. <laughs> when it comes down to a smaller group, the death, the amount of the party's actions you lose when a character goes down is uh -huh. a much higher percentage. Yeah. Yeah. And so you may need to... It even says this in the book. You need to more than take into account by the XP, the smaller and smaller right. the group gets. Yeah. Dude, I'm laughing because like you're like, oh, I took down your guy. So in my Pathfinder 2 game, I've taken down their guys so many times that now I have a part. There are six players and I crap you not. I think four of them have battle medicine mm -hmm. and like two, if not three, have some semblance of healing. There's a paladin with lay on hands and then mm -hmm. there's somebody that's a full cleric now. And I think I think the monk or somebody else also have some sort of healing that they can do. So it's like we have battle medicine, we have healing. It's just like everybody's just like, all right, Luke means business, I guess. So there's just yeah. everybody can heal in some way. <laughs> it's funny when I was playing Pathfinder one, because I, I buffed encounters to also optimize like my group did because they wanted mm -hmm. challenging encounters. It took me hours, but uh -huh. we had challenging encounters. The PCs always won, no TPKs. Yeah. But I killed over a hundred characters in my Rise of the Rune Lords adventure path. Now, yeah. there's a spell called Breath of Life that brings back to life someone who died in the last round, and mm. all but 12 of those were brought back to life with Breath yeah, of Life. Yeah, so that's like- It's because the death of the dying it's system like, in yeah. Pathfinder 1 is not very good. Mm. And so it's like, if you go to negative, like- 10, was it? Well, your con modifier in PF1, but it's close oh, okay. enough. 
Yeah. Um, okay. You die, and yeah. chances are, if you get knocked out, you probably did go to that. So oh, that's yeah. the problem. It's mm. in higher levels, is that it's very bimodal between nobody dropped at all and somebody died. So, yeah. but even mm. with Breath of Life in consideration, I killed twelve. In mm. PF2, I've never killed any. Yeah. And my groups haven't lost anyone, but we came mm. close recently. And Luke, it was because we didn't do what your group did, and we kind <laughs> of had thought we did, but we all realized that we hadn't. We were playing a mammoth. A, a lord ap where we just didn't have a lot of adventure or, of items because we were in the middle of the woods okay. with mammoth uh -huh. i was the party's medic and i my character was very cowardly somewhat and would always like raise a shield and stay in the back but i had managed to draw aggro but we had a bard with soothe who uh -huh. could also heal and uh -huh. we had been just fine we had been yeah. crushing it up to this point we beat a boss encounter uh -huh. we went into just this random encounter that was uh -huh. even just a moderate encounter i think and it decided it didn't like me because it was I was doing all fire damage. That was my thing. I, I yeah. had the medic feats, but mm -hmm. I did fire damage. It was weak to fire. Right. So it came up, uh. it beat the crap out of me. Our bard was out of first level spells, but we were like, okay, we're fine. Luke, we were not fine. <laughs> and we were not fine because we then realized the bard did not have stabilized as not a bardic spell. Uh -huh. Nobody else had medicine or yeah. any healing items. All right. And while the bard had plenty of soothes, the bard was out of spells and could not use soothe. Yeah. So in fact, once my character was down, literally no one in the party could do anything except try to use untrained medicine, which was uh -huh. like almost as likely to harm as it was to help. Yeah. And because of that, my character was actually fine anyway, but the Magus almost died. Um, uh -huh. And we won. We we won. <laughs> and the bard was just like sitting there with my familiar being like, what do we do? The Magus is dying there. And they like worked together to bring over my healer's tools and uh -huh. aided each other and did it untrained. And they were like, okay, there's a 20% chance he dies from this because we critically fail. But on the, if we succeed, he's back and he was dying three. So the chances that he'll recover from that on his own are mm -hmm. very slim. Mm -hmm. and so he did live but it was close right and so yeah. your group is smart you want to have backup plans we all uh -huh. smacked our head because we thought we had potions and we hadn't realized we just didn't have anything because yeah. we had had enough until we didn't uh-huh that's crazy <laughs> my group's also tbk'd once and head characters die so they were like they're they like i don't know if it's because part of it's because i was new to the system so i was making mistakes the other part is I try to have challenging encounters, you know, from time to time. So it, that happens. That's uh, right. We had this one encounter not too long ago where I think they were fighting. They were fighting a barb devil, I think. And was it a bearded devil? Because beard, those yes. are hard. Bearded devil. It was a bearded devil. Those are one of and the hardest yes. creatures for their level oh. in the higher game because yep. of their infernal wounds. That's it. Because that infernal wounds, I'll tell you what, persistent damage. But like it's a notch higher instead of it's like a twenty to yes, get rid of it or fifteen yes, with treatment. Exactly. And so I crap you not. Like it was na during the combat itself when the bearded devil was alive. They're like ah, they killed it right. But then, then after afterwards, the, right? afterwards we had like four of them who were like we're gonna die. And like the boss is dead, but we're gonna die. And they're like trying to yeah. heal and stuff. And like they almost it was it was serious, dude. Yeah. Bearded <laughs> devils are are. They are they are ter diabolically terrifying. Yeah. They're known to be so dangerous if you don't uh, have the right group that like uh -huh. um at early organized play adventures would get review bomb just for including uh, them and uh, then they stopped using them as much because of that. That's, and that's, so like they, they, if you have the right group, it's yeah. perfect. But in organized play, uh -huh. you might not have someone with the right tools. Oh, yeah. And your group yeah. just might all die from the bleed <laughs> I, after winning, which the, the, the crazy <laughs> thing is is that my my there was my players decided to go do a thing that I hadn't planned in advance. I didn't know they were going to go do a thing. And so like, they're like, yeah, we're going to go fight the bishop of this church because he's evil. And I'm like, oh, crap, you know? And so I'm just like, I need like, I don't know if it's a CR six or what it was, but I'm like, I need I need a creature of this level. So I just was like flipping through. I knew he was demonic of some sort. And I'm like, I need a fiend of this level. And I found it bearded devil. And I'm like, this is perfect. And I threw it there. You know what I mean? And then, so I didn't know any of this, but now it makes total sense because that was brutal, man. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it was awesome. Mm -hmm. And some people in chat have pointed out when I said legendary resist might save you from the spell winning the fight immediately if they use the big high level spells, that there yeah. are high level spells that don't even give a save in 5e. And you're right, there yeah. are. Um, and legendary resist won't help against those. Mm. Um, I want to, while we're talking about the encounter builder, bring up a, and here's an advanced technique that I'm going to tell you all about that's not in the book. 
you pro I hope you'll never need to use it because even the fact that you need to use this means you're doing something that's maybe not the best idea. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you how, in case you want to know how, which is what if the PCs are, uh, are in a mixed group and they're not all the same level? Maybe because there's an uh, NPC yeah. that's always following them along who's weaker, but you want mm -hmm. to account for it. Or because you, for some reason, have decided to have the PCs at different levels. I really don't recommend this because one level of difference means a lot. Mm -hmm. And the person who is the junior member is going to feel like they're weaker than the rest, as they are. Yeah. But there is a way that you can do it. If if you get stuck with that for some reason, or like, like I said, maybe they recruited an NPC to join them who was definitely of a different level. And you want to know how much stronger that makes the party, just, just for your own information. There's a way to do it. And um, it does exist in, in some... Pi is a publication that you can find, in fact, um, because I worked on this along with um, John Compton, who at the time was on the organized play team, and we got this through, and, and then Linda Zayas Palmer put it into the guide for organized play. Uh, they have something called challenge points, which is basically the encounter builder, but for your adventuring party to figure out how strong your adventuring party is. Mm -hmm. And so essentially the way that this comes down to is but is it uses the encounter builder style math to tell you how strong that adding a different leveled character will be for your party so mm. let's say your party is all level four like luke's party and let's say that's the lowest level that someone would be and luke's considering whether or not he's gonna let them bring this famous vampire hunter because i've decided they're now fighting vampires who they really schmooze the vampire hunter. They rolled great on diplomacy mm -hmm. and they're like, Van Helsing, you should come with us though. Like, why would you not? Why are you just telling us to go there? And Luke's like, you know, there's not a great reason he wasn't coming with them. And they did get a natural 20 on the diplomacy. Uh -huh. What should I do about that? Like, should I include him? And if so, how easy is he going to make the encounter? So uh -huh. if the group is level four, the way you figure out how much Van Helsing might be worth is... Um, if you count everyone who's in your group as being worth two points, these are smaller numbers, but they really correspond to the numbers from the encounter builder, um, just chopped down to make it easier to digest. Mm -hmm. Then if you add a character that's one level higher, they are worth three. Mm -hmm. And if you add a character who's two levels higher than the party, they're worth four. And three levels higher, six. Mm -hmm. Four levels higher, you probably shouldn't but eight and so on. And it works just like the encounter builder steps up. And so what that means is essentially that if you, if Van Helsing is level six and Luke added him mm -hmm. to the party, that's roughly akin to adding two level four characters to the party. And so when he's building his encounter budget for an extreme encounter or a severe extreme encounter, he would count that as if he had added two characters. Whereas if mm -hmm. Van Helsing was one level higher, that's like one and a half characters. Um, so he would count, he would get one and a half times as much. So you get 60 for an extreme or yeah. maybe 45 for a severe, which you can't really <clears throat> use. So maybe round it down. Mm -hmm. So that's actually how Pathfinder society scales because that's, you know, Pathfinder or society organized play is one where it's like this adventure is for characters from level one to four and anybody can play it and you can have yeah. from four to six players. And how do they figure out how much to send at you mm -hmm. is that they add up two if you're if you're at the lowest level in that range, three if you're at the second lowest, four or six, and depending on how many points you earn from that, you've basically built your encounter for the for the monsters, mm -hmm. and um, that determines how many monsters come out. And so yeah. you can deconstruct it on the other side like that. <clears throat> Again, mm -hmm. I don't recommend putting in people of different levels in most situations. Yeah, is this is this system found somewhere that we can reference it and find it? Yeah, it's it, it actually is, but only in the sense that um, it's a table of the numbers and it doesn't exactly tell you what to do if you're running your own games because mm. it expects that you're running Pathfinder Society where okay. the adventure actually completely tells you how to scale it as those numbers go up. Oh, okay. Because uh, but if you find the free, like, I think it's called um, Organized Play Guide mm -hmm. on Pido.com, it has something called um, Challenge Points, okay. which uh, basically is a table of how much it's worth it to add uh, to the party to add characters in a range of four levels from each other. Mm -hmm. It then does not tell you what to do after that if you're a home GM, because it assumes you've purchased the, the 
adventures that reference that table and right, that right. will tell you what to do but i'm yeah. telling you as a home gm that what you can do with that table is mm -hmm. just may um multiply basically like if, if if they're worth four on that table instead of two like a normal pc that means that you mm -hmm. add twice as many monsters when you add them to the group yeah now and, if i'm now if i'm using a stat block of a a, a creature four is that mm -hmm. assumed that that's it's equivalent to a level four pc is that the way okay. that works is that correct? so that is a an excellent question um, that goes a little even beyond counter design to to um, adventure design and party design. Mm -hmm. I'm here to tell you, having run one shot adventures where I definitely let people play a bunch of creatures from the best mm -hmm. area. Yeah, I had one where like the universe was um, under threat from all of these yeah. weird things that were changing reality, and based on some mm -hmm. retcons that had gone in yeah. in uh, Pathfinder. And so a team with like a demon and a devil and an angel and people from all the alignments right. had to come together to to stop it. And so mm -hmm. I just had them play the monsters. It works, but they are probably roughly as powerful as a character of their level, but they get there more with numbers than with having like 10 to 20 different abilities. Right. And their their marquee abilities might be stronger on a pound for pound basis because they don't have very many. Right. And they might come back at a speed that is problematic for a long going campaign because it was designed around a single encounter. Correct. Where it was yep. like, well, we want mm -hmm. this to be used once, maybe twice in the time that you fight them. So it comes back after this many rounds. Whereas right. if they're just in your group all the time, <clears throat> that means it will be used once maybe twice in every fight right and that, that that's mm. a big difference so, so pound for pound a cr a, a creature four is stronger than a character at level four but there's a rough equivalency kind of is there, what it sounds like they it depends on who you're talking about right okay. like if if you're if you throw them in a cage badge and one of them is a support cleric and the other one is a beater monster mm -hmm. like eventually the beater monster is going to win but it'll take a long time because the support cleric isn't built to win a fight on their own right um but generally they're they are pretty close to each other mm -hmm. but the monster gets there through something simpler so that the gm who just picked it up off the shelf can run it yeah. whereas the right. player gets there through complexity of like a combination of 14 different abilities that they know how it works because they've been playing this character and exclusively this character for three months and right. they know how to combine those abilities. Yeah. So it means that if they're played by someone who completely has never seen them until just now, mm -hmm. the monster will probably do a little bit better because it's easier right. to, to play. Yeah. Whereas if it's played by <laughs> the most veteran optimizer who optimizes tactics and thinks about things and has had a long time, mm -hmm. assuming you don't have one of those weird abilities that is like... <laughs> much more powerful when it can be spammed than it mm -hmm. is in a regular fight where the monster is only encountered once yeah the pc will actually potentially have the advantage uh, with okay. someone who uses everything like a puppet master to their advantage okay. and has had a lot of time to strategize because they have more toggles yeah, yeah. To push like if yeah. you give that person who's a great optimizer a giant it's like okay you, you have two choices you can throw a rock or you can smash them yeah and your numbers are really high they can still probably come up with things where they're like, all right well, most giants would rush forward, but I'm gonna you know, move mm -hmm. back and go behind cover and throw rocks, and yeah. they can still do tactical things. Don't get me wrong, but when you <sighs> give them the PC, that they're like, okay, you have these 50 things you can do <clears throat> between consumable <throat> items, feats, and other uh, features, and all these items that are in your backpack that you can switch out to. They have more to play around with. So that's what mm -hmm. I would say in that regard. <laughs> they are roughly considered to be equal-ish, yeah. but they're mm -hmm. not the same. Yeah, because I have a, I have a player like that in my Pathfinder 2 game right now. She's playing a swashbuckler. And she knows how to play that class. She's like tumble through, get panache, finish her. She's doing all this stuff, and it's just like it works really well. But she knows that character super well. Like if I were to pick it up, I'd be lost. But, you know, I'd just be like, I don't know what to do. I got too much stuff to touch, and yeah, you know, <laughs> all these toggles like you're yeah, saying. You know, that's yeah. why we didn't build monsters that way. <laughs> yeah, well, a game master can't like. For instance, if I were to give my players an NPC, for instance, to go along with them, I wouldn't tell them, go make a character sheet for this NPC. I'd be like, okay, I'm going to find a stat block. Here you go. You run it. I'm probably not going to run it. They're going to run it, but here's a stat block, you know? And for the same yeah. reason, a game master who's like, 
if I'm a game master and I'm going to run, say, six to eight different monsters in an adventure, like I can't prep that many crazy complex character sheets. I need simple to use stat blocks that I can, if needed, glance at and do an OK job at it. Ideally, I'm going to learn those stat blocks before the game session and especially look up spells so I know how many actions to take. Is it a sustain or not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so I could actually have some sort of tactics and make the combats a little bit more tactical and meaningful, you know what I mean? But worst case yeah. scenario, if I have to glance at a stat block I've never seen it before, I can still kind of do it, you know? Whereas a character sheet, good luck, man. 100%. Yeah. In Pathfinder 1, mm. 3.0, 3.5, NPCs were built like PCs, and you yeah. did have to spend a long time building yep. them, only to have them be killed very quickly. You had the whole character sheet. Yep. You had too many spells. Even some Pathfinder 2 monsters and 5e monsters still kind of have too many spells. But in, in those editions, they really had too many spells, including ones that like you really didn't actually have any business using, either for story reasons or for combat reasons that were just too bad to be used in combat, but were combat-only spells. Right. Um, but PF2 tries to make it so that we cut down on those spells to an extent, but it also depends on yeah. who's writing the monster at the time and a lot of other factors. Um, yeah. But absolutely, <clears throat> and that's why simplicity with monsters, because we want the game master mm. to be able to not have to be prepping for many hours, yeah. only to have their monsters killed in 15 minutes or an hour. <laughs> yeah, and we were talking about the idea of the players getting an NPC that would travel with them. And mm -hmm. naturally from that, the discussion went to, okay, how do we rebalance all of the encounters to account for that? And I was literally preparing a video that's going to come out in the future that addresses this topic. And the, the, the idea that I put forth is, okay, if they get an, if they work hard to get an NPC to help them, and then you rebalance all the encounters, are they being rewarded for getting the NPC to help them? Or are you in some way taking away agency, you might argue, because, you know, they're really not getting the benefit of that. You know what I mean? So it's this, inter I don't, we're not going to hash this out right I was now, actually but... going to bring that up. Oh, you were you. So I'm glad okay. that you did. Yeah, because uh, it's this you, you, you brought uh -huh. up the other topic, which kind of diverted us to a different uh -huh. place about like how you build NPCs. But mm -hmm. that was the next thing I was going to say, which is yeah. maybe, maybe if it's a temporary hire, mm -hmm. Uh, or a temporary helper, you don't you don't adjust it. It's just really easy because right. they had that character. But if they are now part of your group forever, yeah. you probably do want to adjust it eventually. And there's also a middle ground where you're like, well, according to this thing that Mark Seifter said, I should be, Event Helsing is two levels higher than us. I should be adding 80 XP of monsters to this extreme Dracula encounter. But I could add zero, I could add 80, but I'm going to add 40 just so Event Helsing doesn't win it immediately but that the group is now stronger than they would have been otherwise um uh, another thing you can do is if the npc is expected to help you can add and maybe if they unexpectedly get the npc and it's seen as a benefit then you don't add there's a lot yeah. of finesse that you need to think about as the gm and you should not just automatically always you definitely shouldn't adjust encounters every time the pcs come up with a good idea to make them easier that sure. is just mm -hmm. a sliding scale uh of difficulty where their cool ideas don't help them but right. i was only bringing that up as an example because i wanted to try to come up with some reason you might have someone at a different level that you had sure. to do Absolutely. even though you weren't just being like well joe missed the last session so he's one level lower than yeah. everyone else and like yeah, or yeah. some kind of thing like that mm, yeah i don't yeah but like you could also just do something as simple as like if they get the npc helper you know i mean don't adjust most of the encounters in the adventure, but the boss fight, you might adjust that one, you know, because you want the, most players in these games want some sort of challenge at some point. And if everything is too easy, it becomes boring, you know, so yeah. they might feel like they had a great success in convincing Van Helsing to come along with them. But when everything becomes trivial and too easy, they're going to be like, oh, we, we ruined our own adventure. That sucks. So the game master can help that along by just making the final fight really hard. And then the players will be like, yeah. look at that all of these other encounters were fine, but that final fight, if we didn't have Van Helsing with us, we would have been screwed. And then they feel even better about having, and you're doing a song and a dance, you're doing some like man behind the curtain stuff there, you know, but at the end of the day, it results in a satisfying game. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. And you know what? 
there's there's ways that you can use that exact tip that you just gave and also fit in a narrative uh explanation mm. that will mm -hmm. really make the pcs feel like it makes sense and that you didn't just arbitrarily adjust it so let's yeah. say Van helsing is like i'm a question pc let's go fight dracula and the vampires and your group was like Okay, but you're an expert monster hunter. We have time for Dracula. We want to fight the werewolves. If you come with us and fight these werewolves, we'll fight Dracula. And then they get a natural 20 and you're like, okay, yeah, I was going to have them fight the werewolves first. I wanted to seed in this thing about Dracula, but mm -hmm. we'll do that. And then you make the werewolves really easy. But then the werewolf alpha, the final encounter is exactly the same, except Dracula sends in some, like, one of uh. his lieutenants, and that is what <laughs> makes it harder enough for Van right. Helsing, and the lieutenant is like, Van Helsing, I've been spying on you for Dracula, and he's, he, apparently, yeah. we need yeah. to help these werewolves. And so it's uh -huh. like, oh, they, Dracula sent this vampire after Van Helsing, and that's why he's here. Right. And yeah. so that way, it doesn't feel like you just arbitrarily added more werewolves that wouldn't have been there mm -hmm. otherwise. Or maybe if it, you don't want to throw the vampires, it's like, well, the werewolf alpha, afraid of Van Helsing and having heard mm -hmm. Van Helsing was on his way, um, was willing to make a bargain with the alpha of another pack. And he doesn't like her at all. Mm -hmm. And he normally wouldn't have if the PCs were coming. He would just be like, I'm going to kill him. But he heard about Van Helsing, so he tentatively made a bargain with this other alpha that was bad for him to get some support and so they have extra werewolves and the yeah. PCs find out about that so you can have it be something in the story that was a natural consequence right. of what the pcs did rather than just like well you know luke and mark were here making a campaign together and they were like well you're too powerful so we just <laughs> gave more werewolves so like you can have good explanations and uh -huh. pcs often appreciate that more they're like oh yeah that makes sense but hey now we can take down this other werewolf group yeah. too so two for one yeah I, I feel like uh that's totally true i have at least a couple players in my pf2 game who are veterans not just players but game masters and they'll know exactly what luke did behind the screen oh but sure, but... at the same time they will appreciate the fact that you put forth the effort of making that story tie in and make it make sense. You know what I mean? That that's... Yeah, you put a fig leaf on it, right? Everyone knows it's behind the fig leaf. But but that detail, that attention to detail is what makes the difference. You know what I mean? Between just like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, whatever. Between, oh, okay. I mean, yeah, that's cool, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's where it, putting that attention to detail is what really is like the cherry on top that can make things more advanced. And that's a good segue into what I want to be like the sort of the latter section of this because i was talking about how to even build an encounter what are the types of encounters when do you use them mm -hmm. but now i want to talk about those spicy encounters the ones that you don't use every time how yeah. do you make a memorable <clears throat> a mate and like an amazing encounter that you don't want to do every time mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be severe even necessarily i even talked about how you can do it with a trivial encounter and the way that you do that is by including things that are different and are not just monsters luke rattled off like four things on his own just like off the top of his head when we were talking about these spicy encounters earlier in the episode things like putting hazards in the middle of the fight mm -hmm. changing terrain like let's say you were in a weird astral space where everything was like dark with pinpoints of stars and there are these moving platforms that just every mm -hmm. round they move and they're like rotating around each other in this weird yeah. pattern and you have to jump yeah. from platform to platform and the ones you're on are moving uh -huh. that my, can be part of it when my players fought tiamat like years ago every round they shifted to a different environment based upon one of her heads so they were in like the mouth of a volcano for the fire head and then they went to this frigid ice plane and then they were in like this swamp area and so the terrain changed every single round you know and so that made it that dynamic made it just super interesting and unpredictable for that matter you know? mm -hmm. yeah absolutely so terrain changes this is one place where um obviously complex and simple hazards i think were great in pathfinder 2 and they are one of my favorite hazard systems i mean i help make them so i'm biased towards that um but they let you tell scenes like the trash compactor in star mm. wars where there's a hazard and a creature and you're dealing with both of them at the same time and um but i will say this which is that 5e by having these environmental things be called layer actions and be put into a section of the book as if you're supposed to use them all the time i think does make it more obvious to the gm that you definitely should use these 
on occasion, whereas mm -hmm. you do have to step back and Pathfinder 2 does say, hey, you should sometimes include hazards and encounters, but it, it doesn't have like a special name for it, like encounter hazards or like yeah. layer hazards or something like that. And I do mm -hmm. like the way that 5e, by calling it layer actions, mm -hmm. is like, remember to, is, tell, is kind of reminding you to include it by giving it a special name. Um, and so in any system that you're playing, adding these kind of things to an encounter can help, but mm -hmm. they're not the only way to do that. Essentially, a way a lot of it comes down to is something to take the player's attention that is not just beating the crap out of the enemies. Right. Not only does it make them more memorable, it also can spotlight players and their characters who aren't always in the spotlight. Mm -hmm. so if there's one person who's a beat stick, who is optimized more than everyone else for beat sticking and can't do anything else, if you put other things in the encounter, it naturally can add spotlight to the other characters. Um, things that might distract their attention. So here's an example. In the, There was a sh short one shot that when Pathfinder 2 first the playtest was first coming out it was called rose street revenge and it came out and i was running demos at origins and one of the adventures uh that was in there that i think was written by linda zayas palmer um you're in this like rickety mansion that you go into to like search for i don't even remember why you were searching it and you get attacked by an ooze and the ooze is like one level higher than the party it would normally be a low threat encounter but that's not all it's a rickety mansion the ceiling is falling and mm -hmm. it's going to deal damage. And there are bats living up there that are very distraught by the fact that the ceiling is falling and an ooze is fighting and they're mm -hmm. going to swarm. Mm -hmm. So you could have, uh, when, when I ran it, like the cleric who also had some good wisdom in nature was like calming down the bats uh -huh. almost every time. One time it was played by a little <laughs> girl who got so happy with the bats and calming down and being her friend. And I was like, yeah, the bat lands on your head. And she was just really thrilled about that. Uh, like the alchemist and the wizard were usually using crafting to try to reinforce the ceiling to get mm. it to stop falling on them. Oh wow! And the fighter uh -huh. and the rogue, the rogue was like, I uh. can't believe this stupid thing can't be sneak attacked. It's an ooze. But they were beating up the ooze. And so if I had just put in a bunch of oozes, like maybe everyone would have gotten spotlight, but maybe the fighter and the rogue would have beat up all of the oozes a lot. Yeah, But this ensured that the fighter and the rogue got spotlight, depending on which time I ran it, I ran it like a dozen times, like mm -hmm. one or the other might have gotten more. But the, then the wizard or the alchemist got spotlight for fixing the ceiling, whoever did it that time. And the cleric was usually the one who befriended the bats and got that. So I got three people who did a major accomplishment for the party in there. Yeah. And it <clears> distracted <throat> them. They weren't all fighting the ooze, because I'll tell you what, mm -hmm. if they all were, the ooze would have died real fast and yeah. it usually got to survive longer mm -hmm. making the fight more interesting for the for the fighter and the rogue for right. that reason yeah 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 that's cool and well, so it doesn't have to be a hazard it can mm -hmm. also be a special condition on the fight i mentioned before a trivial fight but there's an alarm and if the enemies even get mm -hmm. one turn they ring it on mm -hmm. their first turn uh, or they try to anyway, maybe some of them in the room were like sleeping so that the stand up, move over and then ring it. They need all three of their actions. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure it's fair so that solutions other than killing all of them with damage, like I'll slow them so they don't have enough actions to move up, get over and ring it will also work. But mm -hmm. it's like a, it's a challenge of win this fight super quickly before anyone can ring the bell or there are hostages and <clears throat> the enemy like throws a torch and starts lighting the area the hostages are in on fire. Right. Like, yeah. what are you going to do? Yeah. Yeah, you can fight us, but are you going to put out the fire? Are you going to rush in and save the hostages? Some people get to, again, it's uh -huh. all about attention. And if the PCs, they maybe they'll be like, you know what, though? I hate this, but there's only five hostages in there, and this guy is really evil, and he's going to kill more than five people. We have to just focus on it. And maybe it's an easy fight if the PCs all focus on the villain and ignore the hostages, but mm -hmm. they will regret and feel afterwards like we could have done more. Mm -hmm. We could have saved those hostages maybe. Right, it was yeah. easy actually. Maybe we made the wrong call. They'll talk about it. They'll remember the dilemma. And if they do split up, it gives the villain more time to be on stage and they don't necessarily have to be a level plus three villain, the severe villain. Maybe they're only one level higher than the PCs, but mm -hmm. because they distracted people saving the hostages, it was still not like a fight that crumpled into an easy encounter right away because there was some time being spent not on fighting the villain. Yeah. 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 That's awesome.
just different things yep. to do besides focus on enemies and just beat on one guy. 100 percent yeah and you're the gm so when you're building these you know who is in your party mm -hmm. and you can include things that fit real well with someone who's in your party and especially if it's someone who hasn't been getting a lot of spotlight lately like let's say in pf2 actually one of the systems where healers are the best because the the monsters have been created such that if they focus you and if they're a boss if they attack you you will go down before the fight is over if you don't use mitigation or healing at all. Mm -hmm. And so in most times, the healer is doing great. But if your tactics are top notch and you have mitigation from some other sources like defenders, like a champion or something like that, and your group is just really strong, maybe the party healer hasn't gotten to do much recently because your group mm -hmm. has just such good tactics for preventing the damage that they haven't seen people drop or really need the healing yeah and so look at what else that healer can do or maybe it's even healing because they're injured people who are also on the battlefield or something like that and let them do it as and let them feel awesome because they have exactly what they need to hit to handle the non-fighty thing in the encounter even if they yeah. have no combat attack powers and that's part <clears throat> of their character because they've sworn <clears throat> a vow of of peace and you know of non-violence that's fine you can find something for them obviously not every encounter and i even said yeah. don't even try to put anything like this into every encounter it'll right, be right, like right. what's much. the weird thing we have to do this time there were yeah. hostages last mm -hmm. time and mm -hmm. this time they're moving platforms but yeah. you want to do it every once in a while for to make something feel special and mm -hmm. to shake things up and to make it feel like all of the different things that the different players and their characters bring into play are contributing in different ways yeah and i've also found too that part of what makes an encounter boring is if it's static like once the players understand what the situation is and how they win they just have to rinse and repeat that's boring but if you have an encounter where on round one they're like oh we're fighting an ooze cool boom 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 and then on round two oh crap all of this moving around is causing the floor to break away. Oh, we gotta make sure we don't fall through the floor, jeez. And then ooze, and then round two, this is when the ceiling starts, I'm right, sorry, round three, the ceiling starts falling. Oh, jeez, come on now, the ceiling's falling. Round four is when the bats start swarming because of the ceiling falling and all the noise and stuff. And so you don't just perhaps throw all of those elements at round one, because maybe it's overwhelming, but also then it settles into a rhythm by round two and round three. Instead, each round in incrementally escalate, introduce and introduce so that you have a dynamic encounter, right? Where the PCs, the players don't know what to expect next and it's always changing and then they're always having to react and they're having to change their tactics and stuff, you know, and that can make it ex even, even more interesting, you know? Um, again, you can't do it all the time, but w when yeah. they get something like that, it's like, oh, this is something really cool to chew on, you know? An involving so. situation. Fires mm -hmm. actually are naturally an involving situation because yes. they usually spread. Right. And But yes, absolutely. Waves of monsters with reinforcements, another classic um, way that the situation can evolve. Monsters that like phase change when they get to a certain level of hit points mm -hmm. can be an evolving yes. situation or they go to zero and they like they're like a priest of the <laughs> goddess of undeath and when it drops to zero uh, yeah. instead of just dying or going unconscious the goddess of undeath is like i grant you my final boon and they rise as an undead version of themselves for a second form or something right. like that mm -hmm. there are all sorts of ways you can use evolving situations you want to keep yeah. in mind that whatever you gate into a later round is inherently easier than if you put it all together just like luke said mm -hmm. when he was like hey guys it might be too overwhelming to throw it all on round one so you can put more into it if you put them later on that's absolutely correct mm -hmm. the the interesting question becomes let's say that you have a um an encounter that would be 80 xp um moderate encounter and then the moment that those creatures die 80 xp moderate encounter walks into the room so Obviously, we fought all of that from the beginning of the encounter. That would be a 160 XP extreme encounter. Right. My question is, how difficult is it to fight that 80 XP moderate encounter? Mm -hmm. And then immediately, you don't have time to heal another 80 XP moderate encounter that walks right into the door. All right, let me take a stab at this. Okay. 
Oh, and I, compare it to uh, an 80 XP moderate encounter. At least compare it to an 80 XP moderate, you have plenty of time. Then you go into the next room and there's an 80 XP moderate sitting. Oh, yeah. If you have plenty of time, you're going to get healed back up. You're fine, you know. So the difference is, it's like the expenditure of resources is identical between the two scenarios. The real difference is that when they're back to back, there's no opportunity to heal, to rest, etc. Right? So you're going to be down hit points. So you're down the same amount of resources, theoretically, but you're really just down hit points, right? And so I don't think that it's going to be as challenging as if they were all at once. If Because if it was a severe, the damage output would be much faster. You know, or an boom, extreme. Boom, boom, or an extreme. Yeah. It would be much faster. Whereas with two moderates back to back, the damage output is less. It's just over a longer period of time, right? And so I would spitball that you're probably halfway between a moderate and a severe. It would somewhere it'd be probably be somewhere in there that's how i would spitball so halfway between a moderate and extreme otherwise known as a severe that is what almost everyone guesses no i as the answer to this question but that's not what i said oh I, you said halfway between a moderate and a severe even though the xp was enough for an extreme correct yeah that's right okay I, yes yeah i think so if, if i have two moderates so after a moderate is a severe right but yes i think but i gave you enough xp for an extreme but yeah but i don't think it's Okay, I, so I, you're I, saying it's halfway between a moderate and a severe in difficulty. Probably, probably, because it's not, you're not getting your hit points back. It, and I, how much more difficult or less difficult would it be than fighting a moderate, getting all of your hit points and things back, resting for 30 minutes, and then fighting a moderate, do you think? Um, To fight the two moderates with no pause. So if, if you fight a moderate, get your hit points back and fight a moderate again, okay, it's not that big of a deal, okay? If... Because your hit points might have been depleted where you're like at maybe 25% or so, okay? Mm -hmm. But if you fight two moderates back to back, after that first one, if your hit points are between 25 and 50%, that next moderate could very well kill you. And at that point, we're approaching, in my opinion, a severe level of challenge. All right. So you already gave a better answer than some people who say because it is a moderate, is for one moderate is a moderate and... Mm -hmm. All of them at the beginning would be an extreme. They average it out and give severe. Yeah. The correct answer is unfortunately not a simple one. Okay. Because the answer is it very, very much depends on exactly what kind of PCs are in your group mm -hmm. and how they structure their fights. Because it could either be uh, slightly harder like you said, then fighting two moderates with plenty of time to heal and refocus yeah. to get back your focus points. Yep. Or it could actually be easier. Okay. It could actually be easier than fighting two moderates with plenty of time to heal and how get back would, your focus points. How point. would it be easier, dude? Ah, uh, it depends on what your group is. If your group was fighting the first moderate and uh -huh. you're like, oh, this looks kind of rough. You know, it seems like it's going to be a moderate. Uh -huh. So we'll start off with haste and uh, uh -huh. this spell and that spell. And by the end of that, for, you've killed all the things and you're like, okay. And we've healed up because you had a healer, mostly. You've got uh -huh. like three or four one minute long buffs running and the monsters run into you and yeah. say, Rawr! Yeah. Then you're actually in a better place. I gotcha. And the problem is it's highly variable and it can depend on their die rolls, how it's going. So you can't predict. Mm -hmm. It may actually be easier because the monsters are basically running into the equivalent of a cavalry charge against lances that are just like out waiting yep. for them to impale themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but it could be much harder if the PCs struggled and had a very hard time with the moderate encounter. They're all low on hit points, have no spells that are still active mm -hmm. and ran low on resources. So unfortunately, the answer is it's hard to predict, but it, uh -huh. the, the thing that is very unintuitive is that it could be easier than having the yeah. time to rest. Be, be, if you yeah. have up, uh, mm -hmm. up encounter-based resources or like your stance is already active you're still in your barbarian range right yeah and all of those Makes other things so sense. yeah uh it is it is tricky to yeah. get waves um 100 mm. right in it if you try to prepare the waves mm. before everything happens like before you've even run anything if you're willing to do them on the fly which can be like a little bit sleight of handy because you were if you do them on the fly you're not entirely basing them off of how you thought this would go based on like the in-world reasons that the monsters are taking this long to come. Mm -hmm. uh, there's ways around it where you'd be like, this creature's arrogant and they only call for the reinforcements after they're doing so certain amount badly in the fight. Yeah. And 
that way you can change it dynamically but changing dynamically is usually better for being able to gauge how hard it would be that would be something like in in our example that you gave of the ceiling collapsing mm -hmm. on round two you could instead say when the pcs get the the, the ooze to half mm -hmm. or whatever some amount of hit points maybe right. three quarters because we wanted the ceiling <clears throat> to be earlier and the bats to be later mm -hmm. um the ooze thrashes about in pain and then this causes the ceiling to collapse and then that would be on whatever round that happens and it would take longer if the pcs were struggling at the beginning or something like right. that uh whereas if they eat if they just like smack the ooze six times because that's low ac and got it down low immediately maybe mm. it happens in the middle of the first round so you can do it based on how well the fight is going if you don't have a good explanation like i just gave for the ooze or at least that okay explanation it may be pretty meta yeah. but depending on your group social contract your group may be fine with it being meta and just yeah. being like yeah that's fine <clears throat> yeah you could usually sneak those in and they won't know you know if it's gonna be a wave or not you know yep. so because they don't know what's in the next room if the, if the next room was empty but they don't know it and the door opens and two orcs come out like they have no idea what was in that room and that those two orcs weren't planned and they only put them there because this was supposed to be the boss fight and they're like overwhelmingly defeating it and you know that your players like a challenge and they're going to be disappointed if it's not hard. You know what I mean? So yeah. yeah, ask your players, like ask them just in session zero, be like, hey guys, I've been thinking this. And you know, and sometimes when we're looking at like we're in a fortress and enemies might come to reinforce, there's a lot of ways that you could calculate like how long does it take them to pick up their gear? How long does it take them to get up? And it's like, I'm, you could tell them, I'm thinking of like, you know, if it's between two rounds and three rounds, and I'm not sure, picking the one that feels like it's best for the tempo of the fight as it's mm -hmm. going at the time. Yeah. Is that okay with you? Or do you want me to make sure that I then scrupulously analyze it and do the same thing each time? And if they all say, no, we, we need the scrupulous analysis or it will feel like we were cheated of our victory, yeah. then you can do that. But I think most groups will be like, you know what? You were being more than fair to already get it down to two or three rounds. I think I'm going to let you luke or mark uh -huh. decide whether it's two or three based on the tempo to yeah. make it more fun i think a lot of groups will be okay with that i i what i tend to do is i just pick a thing and if the thing that i picked isn't realistic or doesn't make any sense my players will question it and they'll talk about it and they'll be like well that doesn't make any sense you know what i mean and i maintain the strictest poker face that i can and i pretend that i know there was a reason for it my players just don't know what it is. And they'll sit there and they'll talk about it. And they'll try to figure they'll it out. They'll come up with something that works Dude, eventually. But, but they'll be convinced that there's an actual reason. Where the real reason is that Luke screwed up and miscalculated, but he's not telling you. And so they'll 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 be like, there's a reason, you guys. we got to figure this out. Maybe they never do. Maybe it doesn't matter. But if you, if you play it right, you can usually get your players to at least think that maybe just possibly there's a reason. We just don't know what it is as opposed to just being like, all right, DM screwed up, you know? But if you don't play it right, obviously it'll be obvious it, it, that you screwed up or something, you know? So I always just try to like play it like, I know what the heck I'm doing. Of course I do, are you kidding me? You guys just yep. don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and so with ways of reinforcements can sometimes be the hardest to do this, mm -hmm. but to be honest, like something where the cre where like the boss goes up through a phase change and is like, now they're, it's like, their defenses are down, but their offense is up and they go into a frenzy. Yeah. That's the easiest one to do based on what their hit points are at rather than the round because it even makes sense. It's like now they're below half and they just got into a frenzy and they're seeing red. So like yeah. doing or it doesn't even have to be half hit points. It's like, right, they see a lot of their allies going down. Maybe they're f friends with their allies. They're evil, but like they still really care about them. And then they yeah. like that enrages them. So like. In a lot of cases, if what you're doing is making what's already there change in a certain way or be willing to use desperate measures, then it kind of makes sense that it does go along with the flow of the battle. Right. There are other ones that you may have to justify or depending on your group social contract, not justify mm -hmm. and just make it make it fun and dynamic. Yeah, absolutely. So we're getting a little bit low on time here. We got yeah. about well, that's about um, the that's about the last main topic I wanted to make sure we went through. Cool, awesome. Uh, I don't know. I don't. We haven't seen a whole lot of questions in here. But if anybody has questions based upon this, you're welcome to throw them in there. We'll see if we can get to them. I do want to remind folks as well that we have a giveaway going on. We're gonna be drawing the winner to that giveaway in just a few minutes. So 
Uh, the winner will get a signed copy of Into the Fae, a level 1 to 5 adventure module that I wrote. And, or you can get DM Layer Store credit as well. So I will throw a link to the giveaway in the chat here. Um, no, oh, I'm not signed in. I can't even, I can't chat. Oh, you can't do it. I can't even <laughs> chat in my own live stream. Okay, Goliath got me. Okay, thank you, oh, Goliath. Oh, he got you. That's good. I didn't know where it was. Otherwise, I would have done it. No, he got it. I'm like trying to type in my own chat. And it was like, oh, it's not letting me type. Okay, I guess I can't tell anybody anything. So. Oh, I might not have been able to anyway. <laughs> oh, no, you have to be a moderator to. Yeah, there you go. Link in there. So, so what do you guys? So, so we pretty much wrapped up the, the encounter stuff then, right? Yeah, I yeah. think that's everything I wanted to make sure yeah. that I got out. I knew there might be questions because in the previous times that we did this, we had a few questions that we had a pretty lengthy um, mm. diversion of. But I think this time, um, while we went to some adjacent topics just on our own between the two of us, I think we we, we pretty much stayed on point and gave some like yeah. really good, both basic and advanced Pathfinder 2 encounter building mm -hmm. guidelines, but Honestly, especially that stuff we talked at the end about advanced encounters, right. that'll help you in most mm -hmm. similar tabletop RPGs. Even ones that are much lighter or more different, still those uh, same principles can apply. One thing that I don't know if we mentioned or not is the idea that when you're building an encounter, an encounter that has just one type of enemy, creature, or monster is inherently tends to be less interesting than an encounter that has two different types of monsters or maybe even three. So for instance, if you're going against a band of bugbears, let's say, and one of the bugbears is like gonna sneak up and stab you and go melee. Well, if all four or five of the bugbears are just gonna stab you in melee, eh, uninteresting. Now, if three of them stab you in melee, two of them are archers from the rear, that's more interesting. Now your players are going to have to think about tactics, like, oh, how do we get to the archers? The archers are pincushioning our wizard. Holy crap, we gotta stop them. It gets more interesting. Now take it to three. Now you have three bugbears in the front that are pincushion or that are stabbing you. You have one archer that's pincushioning you, and then you have a shaman in the back who's laying down crowd control and different things. And so now you're just you're you're taking the complexity of that and making it a more interesting question of how do we overcome the enemy? And your players are gonna have to use tactics and teamwork and different things to be able to overcome that. It just makes it more interesting. Now the limiting factor though is the game master's brain yep. in having to say it in having You're to right. run multiple creature types so generally speaking like my recommendation is that probably half of the encounters in an adventure let's just i'm spitballing numbers half of the encounters in an adventure are maybe just going to have one creature type keep it simple don't be too complicated maybe a quarter of them you know roughly might have two creature types which isn't that hard to run and it makes it far more interesting and then for the special ones, like maybe a boss encounter or something like that, that's when you get crazy and you have like maybe three of them and you make it really dynamic, you know, and you could do it more often. I don't think that there's necessarily a downside to having multiple creature types all the there's time. There's not as long as it doesn't overwhelm you. Exactly. So I want to give a great yeah. example of this because Luke, you're 100% right. Mm -hmm. So there was a section of, uh, I was running the Jade Region Adventure Path. And one of the sections I had seen like some people online who were a little negative about it because of the fact mm. that they felt some of the encounters were samey. And I looked mm. through it. It was a dungeon mm -hmm. with hobgoblins in it. Yeah. And all of the areas were interestingly different with like tactically different like battlefield weird, like weird like barricades and other things set up. But the problem was <laughs> due to page space, mostly I'm sure, um, since you had to build NPCs with full PC rules, mm. there were these two basic stat blocks for the basic hobgoblins, one of which I, I, I can't remember exactly, but I think it was like a fighter rogue hybrid and then yeah. like a pure fighter. Yep. And every encounter, uh. some of them had like a leader, but every encounter was basically just those fighter rogues and the fighters, and there were a lot of them. So I'm going to say when you have a dungeon with repeated encounters with the same types of creatures it's okay to have way more than 50% that have more than one kind, mm -hmm. but try to limit how many in total you have to build and learn so mm -hmm. that you don't have to learn a million of them. What I did, my group actually loved it and they were like, this is really cool. It was very varied. I didn't even change the setup because the setups were good and they made a cool dungeon. They just they mm -hmm. couldn't take advantage of it because they didn't have space for a lot of creatures. Is I took out the fighter rogue or the fighter, uh, one of each, 
usually in each encounter and i added one bard and one oracle which is like a heal uh, i had a healing oracle was like a cleric -y thing for people mm -hmm. who don't play pathfinder um and the bard was focused on buff the oracle was focused on healing and dispel magic because the party it's because nothing that the other hobbums could have done would have been able to deal with anti-magic sort of um scenario mm -hmm. and um it was pretty high level so the pcs definitely had magic and yeah just by doing that and i mean i i i you know i did a glow up for the stat blocks of the other creatures because i told you at the beginning of this mm -hmm. that i buffed all of them but even then they were like yeah this is great and even though most runes were some combination of those bards and those uh well, like one or two of the bards and oracle uh and then those fighters and the fighter rogues I only had to learn four stat blocks, except for a few certain bosses and other things yeah. for you know, over a bunch of encounters. Everyone thought it was great and varied. They could play with the tactics. Mm -hmm. They felt like they learned what that type of creature could do by the end of it, and they were able right. to handle them better. Whereas yeah. at first, they were like, what? They're that good at dispelling? Oh, they can heal for that much? Mm -hmm. And by the end, they're like, I know what we're getting into. And so uh -huh. it worked out. Yeah. And it's for the same reason you said, <laughs> Luke, which is mm -hmm. that groups that use have different abilities can be more interesting and they usually synergize better than repeats except for maybe a few monsters that yeah. are very very synergistic with themselves yeah you you brought up an interesting idea this has nothing to do with the counter building i don't think but the idea that this guy when he was writing that adventure he was he had a page limit or a word count imposed upon him i'm had, sure he, that's what yeah, it was and he they to, took a lot of space yeah. even with the two yeah, and he had to stick to it. And if he had gone over, his publisher would have been like spanking him over. You know what I mean? And like that reminds me, like right now I'm writing Escape from the Fae, which is the sequel to Into the Fae. And one of the things, like Goliath Cleric's in chat, he works for me. He's Zach. And one of the things he's like, Luke, my the adventures that I'm writing for Escape to the Fae are stinking long. Like each adventure is like long because I'm just not like when we have folks write like for Lair magazine and stuff like we have a word count we're trying to keep it a certain place i'm not respecting that at all which is probably not good but i'm the boss so i can kind of do it if i want to i was but, gonna say but, but you're like the boss. but the thing is is that like i'm making these adventures have more cool stuff in them more moving parts and i'm making them unique i don't want it to every single one just be oh it's a dungeon go in and kill everything and so i'm trying to build these dynamic and interesting elements into the adventure like from like a adventure level too you know and to do that you just need more word count you need more space to do these things you know and so like in your example that guy he was at the mercy of the word count you know and so yeah. people who were saying it's samey it's not his fault if like he's not allowed to use more monsters you know so like you could claim maybe he would could have found the word count but i don't think he could have yeah. and i really honestly and truly think that compared to just by writing these two extra stat blocks that i always included in each mm. encounter and mostly keeping them the same otherwise i mean i buffed them all for my group but that's that's a different story yeah i probably raised the amount that my group was interested in that by like two stars out of five mm -hmm. on a rating scale because the ingredients for an amazing dungeon were almost all there already and right. page count made it, it all they would have needed were mm -hmm. to include like that oracle and that bard or some yeah some kind of spell casting support so that it wasn't just these two stat blocks that were pretty close to each mm -hmm. other and that couldn't even handle certain situations coming up so uh, you're absolutely right page count mm -hmm. is a very fickle um uh, master yeah. and uh -huh. um jewel of the indigo isles the adventure path for mm -hmm. role for combat yeah. is also one where steven was the boss so he just kept saying <laughs> we'll add more <laughs> he wasn't writing it but he was just like add more like uh -huh. linda's as palmer who was writing the third part uh -huh. and it is. steven's like i'll pay you more add more and it just got bigger and bigger and added more things to it and it uh -huh. got really epic but you couldn't uh -huh. do that if you didn't have someone who was in charge who was just like just do it yeah it doesn't matter i know we've already sold it with a certain page count we're just gonna make it more and uh -huh. it'll be more expensive and it's gonna be awesomer yeah like and that and not that, everyone yeah. will agree to do that right well that and that's my theory too it's like we're writing escape from the fey but it's it's eventually going to be a kickstarter where we'll be able to print the entire book right we're just writing it in segments, you know? Um, and my theory is like, look at it, if I put the effort in now to make each one of these really cool, you know, the overall product is just gonna be amazing, you know? So I don't wanna, I don't wanna skimp on it because like most of our adventures 
are, between, are around 7,000 words. Like that's the word count, you know, are, are, they usually have about 10 to 12 areas in them, you know, um, and then, you know, say five to six encounters, basically. So you have like 7,000. That's 7,000 without the creatures because the creatures are in Correct. that separate article, right? Correct. The creatures don't count yeah. toward that. Correct. So yeah, that's it, about what you would expect for a one off adventure. And then you probably are looking at, um, depending on how many pre-written creatures, I bet you're looking at like 3,000 words of custom monsters, maybe but, less. More for the whole whole magazine because you have multiple adventures in it. It could be, but I think the last adventure I turned in for Escape from the Fae was the total word count, including creatures, was something like it was like twelve thousand to fifteen thousand. It was somewhere around there. It's just ginormous. Yeah. Zach was like right at me. He's like, Luke, I think these are too long, man. What are we doing here? <laughs> and I'm just like, hey, man. <laughs> I mean, it, oh. that that's not even that outrageous once you include creatures. I've seen one uh, published mm. one off like scenarios for uh, from Paizo go up to about that long. Um, yeah, when, when when you include the creatures, Zach says it's fifteen thousand nine hundred seven hundred and ninety. Oh, okay. Well, was now exactly that, that's was. above fifteen thousand. Now I've changed my mind. Oh uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's too no, much. No, it's okay. I, I it's gonna be awesome that. though. I gotta right? trim that out. Yeah. So, so there was a question in chat, but it's about a very different thing. So we'll have to save it for like the next time I'm on the stream about Nothing like with how encounters. do you handle social encounters and like non-combat stuff in pf2 because i could talk uh, for hours about the victory point subsystem mm. like i worked hard on writing those base rules for the game master guide in pathfinder 2 and i i like them a lot yeah but that is a very different topic and uh we don't have the time for that i that's, would imagine that would be an interesting topic because when when we're outside of combat like i tend to be more of the leaning of the fewer rules we can use as possible is going to improve game speed in certain things, you know, like for instance, social interactions or exploration, I'm going to be a rules minimist, you know, a minimalist. Whereas in combat, I use the full rule spectrum because it's combat, right? It's a, it's a little bit of a different beast, but I know that I know Pathfinder 2 has all these other rule systems and stuff. And we were, we were, we used the victory point system mm -hmm. recently because you know, the, the idea of skill challenges in fifth edition and fourth edition mm -hmm. and stuff, but well, we were, we were, we were translating, converting, um, a fifth edition adventure that uses skill challenges. I think that's what it was. And then we needed to put into Pathfinder 2. And so we're like, well, how are we going to do skill challenges in Pathfinder 2? Oh, victory points is obvious. Victory points is how? Exactly. Yeah. And so we, that's yep. what we did for it. Yeah. So I would contend that um, the best way to do it is to be able to be a rules minimalist when a light touch is best. Mm hmm and be able to blow that out to a more detailed rules when the stinks or the understanding of what will happen are such mm. that having a tracker is worthwhile. Yeah. So what, such that like having a clock in like um, Forge in the Dark or Powered by the Apocalypse would be, would make sense to have, mm. which are both also not like extremely rules heavy systems um, on, on their own. So that my, my contention is like you, um, We'd have to have a whole episode to talk all about it, but I would mm. say you should not, you definitely should not play a game where every time anyone talks to any NPC, you pull out the influence subsystem, roll dust initiative, it off and be like, all right, you're for, talking to the yeah. bar, to the, to the, um, you know, the, this barmaid, mm. and we're going to use the influence subsystem. And depending on how it goes, yeah. um, she might give you like an extra free ale or like some rumors <laughs> or other things like that. And that and that happens every time you talk to anyone. Do not do this. Well, you know. Okay. The, but the interesting but thing, Mark, if it actually matters, uh -huh. you should be able to drill in. You should yeah. be able to put the microscope on it, and you should be able to have some idea that it's not just hand waved, uh -huh. and that there is a framework for it. Whether that is in a single encounter or whether that is actually the backdrop mm -hmm. to your entire campaign. Like, here's an example. I'm just gonna make something up. That is not in in out of the Fey adventure that Luke is writing probably unless like uh -huh. we brain melded by accident. 
So imagine that you're in the Fey Realm and you're trying to escape it for that's, the entire campaign. That's literally what the campaign is about. Well, I know that that's what it's about. <laughs> oh, okay, but okay, I'm, okay, okay. <laughs> I, I'm going to try to set it up so it's it's correct for the setup, but then okay. do something you didn't do. Okay. Yes. One of the elements of stories about fairies is do not eat the fairy food and do not drink mm. the fairy drink, or you mm. may be trapped or something may happen to you that you can never get back from. Mm. So you could have a victory point subsystem mm. where out, over time, depending on your exposure to the fairy, that you're building up these like fairy points mm -hmm. and what did they well how does that happen it could happen from social encounters with fairies it could happen because you drank the water from a magic well and generally you might even get them from doing things that give you a bonus right now but give you more mm -hmm. of the fairy points and when you get these fairy points the pc gains magical powers but also at the end, when you try to leave, it's harder to leave and you might get stuck in the fairy realm forever, depending on how many fairy mm -hmm. points you yeah. had built up right. and be like, yeah, well, sorry, you became more fairy than human by the end of this adventure. And while, um, you know, while Jane and Emily got out, you you remain in fairy land forever. And so that's a way to use the victory point system that goes across your entire campaign. Right. Another example could be you're rebelling against a totalitarian government. Mm -hmm. Every time you do these social encounters, maybe they are like minimalist. And it was just like, yeah, Luke talked to Goliath Cleric for like 10 minutes and Goliath Cleric said some really good things. And Luke is like, okay, yeah, all of the people from this province have decided to join you. We didn't even roll diplomacy. That was just a really good argument. But Luke might then take the rebellion points up by two mm. and be like, I knew whatever I was going to do with this province that they have a lot of food that can supply the rebellion so the rebellion gets two points and then do that slowly over the whole campaign so it doesn't even have to be one encounter it can be campaign wide yeah so that's my pitch for the fact that having that framework is good even if you never mm. use it because you can use it right no i agree there, there are definitely certain situations where it's meaningful and matters that we're tracking that especially over the course of campaign that can be cool but, you know, the, your barmaid example where, you know, she comes up to you and you're using, like, you know, this social system to determine, like, if, if she slips something in your drinks or that your food gets spit in or something. Like, the interesting thing is that I would say that probably for the vast majority of groups, it's undesirable. But you know there's a group out there that would love a, a mechanical system for interacting with the barmaid and figuring that stuff out. Like, they would. And no, I think you're that, right. I know I said not to do it, no, right, but, no, but that, I'm not like saying anything against what you said. My only point. No, was you're that, right. Some group might want it. Yeah. <laughs> and and my, my point is only that there's a wide diversity of player interest and stuff like that, you know, that's out there that makes it really cool, you know, and that's where the game master comes in and they're like, OK, I know my players love this crap. We're going to go full bore on this victory points, every stinking interaction rolling initiative every time my players love this crap you know so um there's never like you know a hard and fast rule for everything but vast majority of times you don't want to bust out victory points for a social interaction your players are probably going to roll your eyes and and maybe not come back <laughs> i don't know look i wrote the victory point systems and the influence system mm -hmm. okay in pf2 now that was based on an influence system that um was written by Linda Zeiss Palmer in PF1, who based mm -hmm. it off of something written by Thurston Hillman. And a lot of people wrote similar yeah. systems. But um, the point is, I agree with you. You do not want to use it every time. And I also agree, even though I made the example of every single person, mm -hmm. um, like, and I gave a barmaid as an example, maybe a carousing victory point system is right for groups where you see how well you caroused. And if you get bad at, at, on your victory points, you, mm -hmm. you're drunk and hung over the next day. And if you roll well, you gain plot hooks and yeah. boomers and like really cool mm -hmm. useful stuff that actually might be awesome for some groups Dude, and the, you, the, the, you, the yeah. point for victory point systems is you need to know your group understand the social contract with session zero figure out what they are interested in and use victory points on those yeah. figure out what people just kind of want a minimalist and just kind of talk it out and go through kind yep. of hand wave yep. and don't let that be fast don't exactly. take table time your table time is precious it puts a spotlight mm -hmm. and like a picture frame around something and is telling people this has victory point. This is important. So if you do it for something that's not important and that you don't care about, that's yeah. a mistake, I think. So, oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You don't want to spend table time on stuff that doesn't matter. Right. Um, all right. So the winners of the giveaway tonight 
is Joshua from Arkansas. Joshua from Arkansas, I will be sending you an email to get you hooked up with a copy of this Into the Fae for DM Layer store credit. So I think we're gonna call it right there. Thank you, Mark, for coming on. I really appreciate it. I love doing these little deep dives into aspects of Pathfinder 2, um, not only because it delivers, delivers tons of value to people, but also because it helps me learn because like I'm running the game myself. So there's a selfish motivation in it. So really next appreciate time it, we'll yeah. do the victory points one yes. for um, who was it who asked for for Hector Vivi's. We'll do mm -hmm. a more in-depth thing on it. But I think we have viewpoints that are not exactly the same, but that mm -hmm. also are compatible uh, that oh, yeah. can give people a lot of different perspectives on it. Yeah, I think that would be that'd be tons of fun. So thank you, dude. Really appreciate it. Go ahead and stay on here as I close out the stream. So. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are done. Have yourselves a wonderful evening. Um, I'm going to find a button and I'm going to push it and we're going to end this. Stop.